79 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm here with Pervez Edmund. Hey, welcome, uh, listeners, and welcome, live audience. Okay, <laughs> good, that you're going to spoil us. Um, now, it's, you know, it's kind of funny, Zaki. We've actually done uh, a spat of like live recordings more recently, which is really well, unusual. All our us. recordings are live. And this is true. This is true. But uh, we just got back from a road trip in Michigan where we had some live recordings, in, i.e. in front of a live audience, um, and not just with a live guest. And, and we spent four hours on the road with each other, yeah. and we're still here. Yeah, so that's We made it. That, that does say something, yeah. The we quintessential can odd stand, couple. We can stand to work with each other. <laughs> the quintessential odd couple, and if we are the odd couple, who's Felix and who's Oscar? Oh, you're Felix. Oh, okay. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So we've settled <laughs> that. But anyway, um, we're we super excited. Yeah, 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 I got it. Unabashed. But um, uh, yeah, we're super excited because uh, not only are we here at Talib Collective, now we've recorded unofficially at Talib several times. You're right, yeah. But this is the first time that we have the distinct pleasure and honor of being a collaborative sort of effort this evening with Talib Collective. So shout out to Talib, and uh, full disclosure, I serve on the board of this wonderful organization. So I, I did do a little bit of hand twisting, arm twisting to make this happen. So, but again, thank you to all those involved for making this happen. And thank you for our guest this evening, who is? Uh, we are joined by Zainab Ismail, who was born and raised in New York City. She worked as a celebrity trainer for years before converting to Islam and beginning her work, Fit for Allah, which takes on prophetic traditions regarding health, medicine, and food, and melds them with fitness practices. Zainab Ismail, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum Thank you so much. And uh, all the way from the East Coast. Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Oh, wow. So it's funny because one of the guests that we did record with in uh, in uh, Michigan was Dr. Suad Abdul Khabir, uh, Abdul Khabir, who's also from Brooklyn. So, oh, mashallah. Yeah, the Brooklyn sisters represent. So uh, that's great. We're really excited. And uh, I guess, you know, for those who listen to the show, and I know uh, Zainab, you shared with me that um, you do, you have heard a few of the episodes, so you kind of know where we like to start things off, which is tell us your origin story, uh, where you hail from. Uh, your background, we'd love, to, we'd love to hear about that and start there. Okay, so let's take it back to the Bronx. Um, raised originally in the Bronx, and I moved to Brooklyn. Uh, pretty much the rest of my adult life was in Brooklyn. I come from being a born and raised New Yorker, typical Bronx, Brooklyn. I lived my life to the fullest of the dunya capacity. I was a celebrity personal trainer and nutritionist. I was a national level fitness competitor. I was in Hollywood, Las Vegas, Miami, Hamptons. That was the routine until suddenly something happened and I said, this is just not enough anymore. And then Islam came into my heart. Uh, it was back in 2009. I was traveling again, you know, straight out of a video. Uh, white parties, the private jets, the celebrity parties, the celebrity athletes, you name it. And then there was just something missing. Even though I was born and raised Catholic, uh, um, New York, Puerto Rican, and it was just something still like, I don't know, it just wasn't doing it for me anymore. Would you say up until that point that faith or Catholicism was a big part of your life, or was it sort of more of like being a cultural Catholic at that point? I think, I mean, I still was very practicing. However, there just was never any like real life direction or like there was no what you needed to do or in a certain situation, how do you handle this? There was, you just, it was the Ten Commandments and you showed up on Sundays and that was kind of it a couple of other times throughout the year. But like when you were struggling with anything, you really didn't have anyone to go to. Now, I should, I should also, also mention that, I mean, we are recording on Easter Sunday, so certainly, I guess Easter yeah. was certainly a big part of that. Yes, no, definitely. I, um, 
made sure uh, at some point today to uh, send Happy Easter to my family. I mean, most of my family is not really Muslim friendly. Uh, let's see, I think my grandmother didn't talk to me for two years, Alayya uh, Hama. She's no longer with us. And, you know, my father's a born again Christian pastor, evangelical Christian from Orlando, Florida. Uh -huh. So his politics and choice of, uh, you know, emphasis on the way he uh, practices his religion doesn't exactly agree with mine, but he does tell me he'll pray for me to come back to Christianity. Right, wow. Um, so I, I guess, I mean, so much to unpack there. We, you know, it's one of the things we like to do on the show is unpack. Um, but I guess, first question, you know, apart from sort of your religious uh, framework and sensibilities, of, you know, get, you know, and what led you to Islam, definitely want to talk about that. But I guess uh, in terms of a career choice, like fitness, and was that always sort of a part of your Oh, life? no, no, no. Um, I mean, I guess because I graduated from high school so early, I was a freshman in college at 16. Uh, in my mind, I was very convinced that I was going to go to law school, uh, but in the process, my parents got divorced, and that kind of went, change plan. Accounting is really easy for me. Let's do accounting. But then when I started at uh, a CPA firm, I was like, oh my god, I can't do this for the rest of my life. There is just no way. I'm too much of a people person. So at the time, I was already exercising and already involved in the fitness arena. And I found out about something called fitness competitions. So I went ahead and started uh, preparing for my first fitness competition, and I actually won. So I was like a New York State champion uh, for fitness, what was called Fitness America, and I then went to go compete in California, in Redondo Beach. So I was like, okay, this is very familiar, and I started to learn about they were like, oh, there's this certification uh, happening next week in New York. You should definitely take it. I was like, oh, okay. So I ended up going to the certification. And because I was already in the accounting field, uh, just having a business background and just being a bit more professional, the people that were hosting the event were like, wow, you'd be really good to do, be a manager. I was like, okay, I haven't even passed the test yet. So before I knew it, I was uh, managing I actually took a leave of absence. Uh, I was like, I cannot go back to account. I'm done. Mm -hmm. uh, so I took a leave of absence, and I started working uh, first as a nutritionist, and that was it. I was sold. And then it's been ongoing education year after year. At some point, I was then uh, one of the first uh, facilitators uh, nationally and internationally for the National Academy of Sports Medicine. So, like, for instance, if you ever go to a gym and you see something called a foam roller, I'm probably one of the first 20 people in the country to teach that. Mm -hmm. So, most people don't realize how long I've been in the industry and also come, like, that's why the like, traditional salon was so easy for me. Like, Senate is not chain of narration, getting your information from the teacher to the teacher. I took from like the equivalent of the Imam Zaids and Sheikh Hamza of the fitness and movement industry. <laughs> so go figure that. <laughs> That's amazing. And you know, it's funny, like uh, on the show we've had, you know, Rahat Zabali was involved in, you know, uh, again, fitness trainer, personal nutritionist to Hollywood stars and celebrities as well as sports athletes. Um, but I guess picking up on a conversation that, you know, when we first, when, when you first began, in terms of something lacking in your life and what sort of what was that sort of, uh, I guess, that, that inertia that set in that, that, that compelled you to explore other uh, religious possibilities beyond Catholicism? Um, and what was it maybe that drove you to Islam in particular? Well, I mean, growing up in New York, I mean, I grew up in the home and origins of hip hop. So there were always Muslims around, everywhere. Right. I've always been around Muslims. If there wasn't ever an inclination to, to really seek out, but I went to a friend's wedding in 2009 because my chef, my 10th chef anniversary is coming up in June. And it was, let's just say, March of 2009. And I went to a friend's wedding at a Catholic church. And uh, something just struck me like, this seems so robotic. Everybody can't possibly be going up to get the what's called a Eucharist because you're supposed to go for confession. And I said, this just seems so fake. 
So when we came out, I said, you know what, I just can't be Catholic anymore. I'm just so over this. It's just something just didn't feel sincere and transparent. It just didn't feel right anymore. What I did know is that I didn't want to be Jewish because I'd always been working in different centers around New York, and I knew they just didn't want to let you be Jewish. You had to be married, you had to go to classes for um, 10 years. I was like, so I knew I didn't want to go that route, but I knew I wanted to stay within the Abrahamic faith. But I didn't know how do you become Muslim. So I said, okay, Google, how do you become Muslim? I was like, that's it? Just say that? Where's all the you know requirements? So I called up my friends, um, uh, Egyptian American family. I was like, uh, thinking about taking my shahada. Oh, <laughs> you know? and they were like, okay, we're gonna go to the masjid, get you all these books, get you a Quran, every translation, Spanish, English, Arabic. I was like, I'm not gonna read any of these books. <laughs> I mean, it's just not gonna happen. So. It was more but professional. It was personal, purely spiritual. spiritual. Yeah. Uh, so I said, okay, in my mind, I didn't know what intentions or Ania was. I said, okay, I want to be Muslim. That's the choleric in me. I want to be Muslim <laughs> by Ramadan because I want to fast. So I didn't know how it was going to happen. Again, I didn't read a book. I didn't anything. And now we're getting close to Ramadan. I was like, I had to do this. So I was coming back from a trip uh, from LA, and I was going to my car, and again, I didn't know what Hushu was, or like in hand, or anything. All of a sudden, it was like Allah went, Whoosh! it's in my heart. I was like, okay, I'm ready to take my shahada. Nothing, it just was as if the information was already there. So I called my friends up again, and they were like, okay, la 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 la. <laughs> So they were like, okay, we're going to go to the next year on Friday, Juma, blah, 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 we're going to meet at this time, but they were obviously in our standard time, and somehow we didn't make it. But I was like, they told me, you don't need to do it in the rest year. So in front of Allah, my computer screen with the angels present, I took my shahada by myself, and then it was, that was where my journey began. Wow. Amazing story. Yeah. Like you had that moment of sort of epiphany, and it was like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna do this now, and that's it. So, yes. Um, what was the sort of, the, I guess, the leeway between like taking your shot and then having to trial by fire or Ramadan? Oh, well, let's talk about that. Sure. So, as a nutritionist, right. I was like, okay, fasting, I know fasting, juice fasting. What do you mean? No one told me what kind of fast, only fast I was a nutritionist was juice fasting. So, my, I still didn't even know how to pray or anything. I mean, I had just gone the week before to Miami. I was like, okay, I got one week, all right. So now it's Ramadan. First, first thing in the morning, I went, uh, I had clients in the West Village, so I went to the juice spot, got green juice, because I thought that was what you meant by fasting. And I called my friends, I'm like, listen, I need to learn how to pray, it's Ramadan. They're like, okay, come over. So my friend Ahmed and his sister Fatima, we printed out, because there was no books for converts, at least I didn't know there was. We printed out all the papers. I like had a stack of papers every step by step. And that's how I started to learn. And they were like, okay, wait, are you fasting? I was like, yeah, I just had a green juice. They were like, that's not fasting. I was like, what do you mean? It's kind of fast. I knew you didn't tell me. And then I didn't even know that it was a, Sword time. Like, I didn't know. I didn't know there was a Tarawi. I didn't know there was a sword time. I didn't know there was times of prayers. So that was like winging it a little bit. And the funniest thing was, and then it was time to go to my first Iftar. So uh, another friend, uh, they're Syrian American, and they invited me. I was like, oh my God, Kenny, his mother wears a jab. I gotta go with a jab. Because I don't want to like disrespect the family. So my friend takes me to get a scarf, and then at the time, there definitely were any YouTube tutorials, but me, the fashionista, I had to watch every tutorial that was possibly available, that I did my hijab, that everybody was like, oh my god, how'd you learn how to do that? <laughs> YouTube. So I get there, I'm all excited. Well, first of all, before I left my house, I was like, oh my god, I gotta go outside now. My whole building is Republican, and they're definitely not Muslim friendly. 
And my heart was like this. I looked out the people. I live in an apartment that's New York living. I'm like, okay, I gotta get from my house to the car, and it's two blocks away. Okay. Okay, I got this. I didn't know to say fist me up, but. And subhanallah, didn't say subhanallah. No one saw me, so I like went stealth mode into my car. I got to the guitar. I get in. Nobody has on hijab. I was like, what's going on? I go to Kenny, which I then find out his name is really Kusay. I was like, I thought your name was Kenny. Who's Kusay? I said, why is your mother not wearing hijab? He was like, stupid, she's home. I was like, oh, okay, basically. Um, so after Ramadan, I was like, okay, I really need to learn what to do. This is just, obviously, I'm not being taught properly. I come from a very methodical way of learning. I need to so go back to Google, new Muslim program, and there comes the Mecca Center. Alhamdulillah. So I go to new Muslim, Program. I sign up for the new whistle program. I walk in in my gym clothes, and then everyone introduces themselves. And my teacher, Alayud Hummel, says, Brooklyn, where are you going dressed like that? I was like, oh, I just came from the gym. So, alhamdulillah, basically the school I ended up in, boom, landed right into traditional Islam, Shafi school, all my teachers are Shafi, and then like two years later, my first maulid was with Habib Omar bin Habib. And I was serving in the school, so I met him, and that was it from there. Tell us a little bit about Mecca Center. Okay, well Mecca Center, actually, Imam Zaid is on the, on the board and has been an advisor of Mecca Center since its inception. It's been there, it's, it's uh, about 10 or 11 years old now, and it was founded with the intention to serve the greater new Muslim community as well as those who might have been born to the faith, but maybe their parents in practice. So we call them born birds. So we have the converts and the born birds. And basically, every teacher that came to Mecca Center had Senate and Isna, chain of narration, going from a scholar to a scholar to a scholar back to the Prophet I mean, within my first year of being Muslim, we were covering the books of Imam Haddad and Imam Ghazali. So it was, we really hit it. at the right spot at the yeah, right time. Yeah, and it was a no-brainer for me because that's the structured type of environment that I came from, especially in the movement world. So, alhamdulillah, I mean, like I said, I was barely even Muslim two years and Habib Umar came. I mean, we had Sheikh Samar Nas. I mean, I was like, we were called like baby Muslims. Like, oh, we are baby Muslims. And we just soaked everything up, you know, and it was amazing. And then I started, then it was like, okay, I need to learn more. Then I finally, um, I took a trip to uh, Canada to go to my first RAS in 2014. And then that's when I first saw Habib Ali at Jeffrey. And that was, I mean, I was like, okay. And of course, me being the student, everybody knows if they know me from RIS, I was front row, first seat for four years. Like, and if anybody knows the massive rush, and we'd be downstairs at like right after Fajr, like soldiers to get to that front row. And I mean, it was like for four years, hilarious. And then I was like, okay, I need to start learning more. So I started to go to Turkey, then I started to travel more, and then I got to go on Sacred Caravan, which she comes in 2014 and 15. And that was really my turning point into really delving greater into prophetic nutrition, because it was an easy marriage from holistic nutrition, and also just as I was a Muslim, every Ramadan throughout the year, I would just observe there was a disconnect between what I was reading in the Shamaya and Tigmidi and also just in what I was reading about the Prophet So I, I just started to see, I'm like, wait, why is everyone eating so much? Why is there so much meat? Why isn't there this? But the Prophet ate that. And really, as a nutritionist, many of the foods from the prophetic tradition are things that we've implemented with patients and clients as long as I can remember because these foods are healing. For example, like beets. If someone is 
let's just say, constipated or anemic, we always recommended beets so, or dates or different things. So it was just really, that door just continued to open and then really Sheikh Hamza is the one that pushed me and said, this is your manna, you need to do this. Maybe he didn't say it like that, but it felt like that. Right. <laughs> Especially like if you're in the middle of Medina. Right, I mean, you can't think of a better calling, right? Mm. I mean, not only in terms of your own background, but um, like you said, making, like, just observationally seeing that people, there was a disconnect between what you saw as prophetic practices with regards to diet, probably even exercise, like uh-huh. fitness, yeah. um, you know, being physically active, and then uh-huh. what you observed Muslims doing, which right. you did observe that disconnect. Um, why do you think that is the case? I mean, because I know food and uh, activities around food is such an integral part of our community, and that's not always a bad thing, but, you know, it can lead to sort of a, you know, the, the right. consumption and so on. Right. Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. I think for one, like for for instance, with just people having the skill set and the background and experience in nutrition and in movement, um, just with my skill set or the different layers of education that I have, there aren't any Muslims that have certain education. Uh, it's just not areas or fields. Uh, a field of interest that has been a focus for the Muslim community. And alhamdulillah, in the past five years, you are seeing, uh, let's just say, I'm going to speak for the sister side, you are seeing more women engaging in the beginnings of a movement or fitness or nutrition career. But being in the industry 25 years, with that comes layers of education and there just wasn't anyone Muslim with that background. So it was like Allah just went, right. okay, we're gonna Islamify this <laughs> and bring it to the community. Now as for why it's so prevalent, I really think that lack of resources, lack of knowledge in these fields or in the emphasis maybe in Sunday schools uh, about the Sira and the Shamay, and really emphasizing that. It's like anything else, there's been such a, Emphasis on the outward, maybe in a lot of places. That's what I was going to say. I, mean, right. I think one of you know, to borrow an expression from um, from fitness or health, you know, anemic. One of the things that I find has been unfortunately anemic in terms of research and study within traditional Islam, or even you know, with regards to an examination of our or a curating of our tradition, is this idea of focusing on fitness and nutrition and stuff. I mean, we have such a rich heritage of law, philosophy. Mm-hmm. Theology, but I mean, this was something that the Prophet spoke of time and time again, yeah. and the Quran's really mm-hmm. addressing. Yet, you know, it's been almost really anemic in terms of real development. One hundred percent. I mean, when you look at what unit of prayer are six hundred fifty plus muscles and every major joint, ankle, knee, hip, shoulder, head, neck, and spine are involved in one unit of prayer, and approximately one quarter of the Shamayi the characteristics of the Prophet are related to food, drink, how he fasted, what he broke his fast with, and the things he recommended. So that's a real huge portion. So that means that in general, the I think the emphasis on learning about the Prophet is something that we need to revive. And it was something that it just, it was as if that information was already in me. I can't really say, it wasn't like I actually thought about doing this. It just started to, Allah just started to open, 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 open. And it just put the scholars, I mean, for my short time of being Muslim, I've sat at the feet of many of our senior scholars and taken from them, traveled with them. I've been to Mecca Medina now four times. I've done Hajj. So I think all of that and that seating, I mean, Really, I don't think I tasted my faith until I had my forehead down in the Rauda in 2014 in the presence of the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is tasting my faith. And that really was the turning point to really delve further into the revival of prophetic nutrition and the emphasis on bringing people and hearts together. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't come, he wasn't a doctor, but he was a doctor of the hearts, a healer of the hearts. 
and bringing hearts together. And that's really what we learned from our teachers, especially even Sidi Usted, Usama Kanan, uh, may Allah preserve him and grant him full shifa and afia. That's what we learned from our teachers, whether it be Dr. Umar, whether it be Sheikh Hamza, whether it be Imam Zaid, whether it be uh, Habib Umar bin Hafid and, and, and all of the Habib and many other of the scholars, it's bringing the hearts together. And then came the serving people. So now I travel to four or five different countries serving people, uh, Muslim communities uh, around the Caribbean and South America. And alhamdulillah, uh, we have, in collaboration with Sandala and Dr. Asad Tarsim, uh, we have translated his book, Being Muslim, into Spanish. And now just recently in Portuguese, we were just in Brazil three weeks ago to launch the book. So it's all really about purifying one's heart, bringing hearts together, and helping people come to Allah and the Prophet What else is important? Um, so I guess, I mean, you know, seeing that uh, for, I think, I think a lot of the listeners this episode will probably drop right before Ramadan or maybe even right at the beginning of Ramadan. So, you know, you're talking about prophetic uh, nutrition. Um, I, I guess kind of maybe using that as a way to, uh, and we'll get into like maybe some advice for Ramadan, but uh, maybe kind of highlight for those who listen, you know, who are listening, you know, what prophetic nutrition means to you and, and what, what were sort of the sort of broad salient features of the prophetic nutrition. Mm -hmm. The essence of prophetic nutrition is love of the Prophet. Yes. Yes. To know him is to love him, and to love him is to know him. And he and everything he recommended is healing. And if you suffer from stress, anxiety, panic, depression, connect to the Prophet. Not negating that there is, if there's a need for mental health care, et cetera, et cetera, but <coughs> that's it. Mm. That healing. Healing, yeah. And, and you know, <coughs> it's remarkable when, you know, you talk about healing, um, you know, in the context, and you, you know, you, you mentioned one unit of prayer, um, you know, the, inter the uh, inseparability between one's heart or, or spiritual uh, essence, uh, one's physical body, and then one's you know intellectual or <coughs> mental acuity. So you know, seeing the human being in totality, right? And that's something that we also see, like in the you know, in the Sira of the Prophet, right? so as seeing human beings as being that composite of a mind, body, and soul, and then engaging the human being on all levels and capacities, right? And so certainly that the, the body, one's physical. Sense yes. or, or essence has to be right on you and has certain uh, obligations that one must fulfill. Yes. To that, right? So that's certainly something we learn from this year. Of course, and first and foremost, our <coughs> body is in a manner between us and Allah. Mm -hmm. So He gave us this body, we have to return it to Him in the same condition He gave it to us. I mean, just something that's interesting, what breaks my heart is. Uh, seeing when someone's prayer has been removed from them because they cannot put their seven limbs on the ground that they have to sit uh, in a chair. And that's a removal, whether it be that by the person's life choices, they do, their health has degraded to the point that they cannot pray with seven limbs on the ground, or something has happened to them, a trial or tribulation that Allah has placed in their life. However, uh, I travel to a part of Mexico called Chiapas, and the Muslims there have been Muslim more or less since 1996. Uh, they don't speak Spanish, they speak a Mayan dialect called Sotzil. And even the most, the elders in their 90s, no one, I, I've never seen anyone pray in a chair in Chiapas or in Cuba. What do you attribute? Their lifestyle, lifestyle. Uh, they don't have the luxuries mm. and the dunya that we have. I mean, and by lifestyle, I mean I'm assuming, and, and you mentioned dunya, cars, so, right, right, uh, so, sedentary computers, sedentary lifestyle, and just lavish. 
Mm. I mean, everything that, even the poorest person here is rich compared to the people in certain countries that hold to the rope of Allah by pure iman. They don't have anything. They don't ask for anything. They don't look for anything. They just want to worship. So what's our real purpose? Is to worship Allah. So if in that we need to maintain our health, it's something that we need to consider. And I think, you know, the mix of cultures and just the environment and how, you know, different people have, say, come to the country and just what has been the emphasis uh, health and nutrition and wellness just maybe wasn't. But I see it starting to turn around, especially somewhat on social media, for example. But I think it's important, again, because for me, anything that reminds me of the dunya, I run the other way. I've been there. That's living Jahannam on earth. There's nothing attractive. I've been there, done that, seen it all. So everything that everybody's trying to speak so close to, I run. Like, because there's nothing appealing about it. But there needs to still be a presence on social media of bringing people to Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu but in a way that's in a language that they understand. And I think that's something that uh, is lacking, but we're trying, we're striving. I mean, I would tell anybody, if you're struggling with your Iman, pick up, get on a plane, go to Cuba, serve people, you'll come back a new person. Inshallah. Hmm. Um, so, uh, so much to, 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 that I want to talk to you or with you about. Um, the, uh, you know, you, like you talked about the, like, you know, unfortunately, modern life in America. Sorry, I went a little No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think, the, you know, the idea of prophetic nutrition and the value there, and, and, and I, I really want you to kind of, uh, you know, share your expertise in that in that arena. So I just want you to kind of talk about that, certainly. But um, you, you you touched on sedentary lifestyle, and I mean, almost with every new technological advance that comes out, I find that we are becoming more and more sedentary. Right? I mean, now literally with like streaming services and so on, you don't have to even get up and make the journey to the TV anymore to change the channel or whatever. Everything is literally push button and at your fingertips. So how do you swim against the stream, as it were? Like, how do you swim against that tendency that we have to make us more and more just sedentary? I mean, that's just the name of the game now. It's all about convenience, right? And that's what people pay premium money for. Okay, because we're in California, I'm going to speak to the people of the Bay. <laughs> what I started my day today with is my annual ritual, and I did Mission Peak. Nice. You do Mission Peak once a week, you're straight. <laughs> Seriously. No, so uh, I think that... It's a legit hike. Yeah, it's a legit hike. It's my annual ritual. Nice. I mean, I'm from the East Coast. I'm like, oh my God, a cow, a turkey, oh my God. You know, I mean, there was a line of tourists trying to take a picture at the top of the peak. I was like, okay, I've done it already. Yeah, too. Um, I think that the key most important thing, if I were to recommend it, any type of movement to anyone. And I, I'm, I'm steering back towards calling it movement versus exercise because the idea that people have of exercise means like, er, 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 gym, oh, two hours, oh. And you know what, that doesn't work for everyone. That's right. That's right. In, in many, for different, for many different reasons. Time, right. logistics, it's just not appealing. And it may not even work for their type of personality and temperament. It just, it's not for everyone. Walking, every part of your body is involved with walking. So flexibility and walking is, if I were going to say to someone, you have an exercise over here and suddenly, okay, in Ramadan, you want to be gung-ho and start your program, not the time to start your program, but I'm not going to detour you. Walk. It will help with circulation, digestion, and stimulate those nice hormones, feel better, your body just feels refreshed, get outside. You guys are here in the Bay. I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer. I'm like, most of my friends, they can go in their backyard. I'm like, there's a trail in the backyard? Man, 
I have to drive almost an hour. I mean, Central Park is hard, but like a real trail, I have to go about an hour. I mean, you guys are so blessed here. It's not even, I mean, mashallah, really get into nature, connect with nature, connect with the law's creation so that, you know, it's hard to counter all of the sedentary parts of our lifestyle. Obviously, if you're at a desk for eight to 10 hours or in school or behind a computer or behind a phone, you need to at least move. And if movement is gonna be walking, we can start there. The rest can come. The same thing when someone takes their shahada, they don't know how to pray, they don't know how to fast, they don't know anything from anything. We don't tell people they need all these requirements to take shahada. We want you to take shahada so no matter what, you can die in la ilaha illallah, the rest will come. It's the same thing with the body and with movement and with nutrition. It's, we need to, as Dr. Omar would say, change the cognitive frames and really simplify what people are so fearful of. That's right. I always find, like, you know, it's, you, like you mentioned going to the gym or whatever, I mean, or with any exercise or physical activity, it's often the, the kind of dread associated with just having to start it. But once you start it, once you're doing it, you know, it's a cinch. But it's just that getting over that hurdle, mental in those cases, just, oh, I gotta do, you know, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get on, I gotta get on the treadmill, or I gotta get on the trail, or whatever may be the case. Um, it's that mental sort of hurdle that you have to overcome. And because we are bombarded right. by these images of perfection that's not really perfection, because it's artificial perfection, and it's, you know, what other things are causing, say, like these images of people that we think look perfect, but it's probably so toxic. If you knew what it took to look like that, you'd run the other way. The main thing is, make the intentions to get fit for the sake of Allah. Let it be a worship, let it be a virtuous deed. And do what is consistent, even if it's little, because that's what's the most rewardable to Allah. Do what is consistent, even if it's little. And even if you commit to 10, 15 minutes, no one will ever tell you, okay, work out 10, 15 minutes, or do something for 10, 15 minutes. It's always gonna be like an hour, an hour and a half. Like there's no, it, it's just like from zero to 60, but most people can't do that. It would not be realistic for their lifestyles. It has to be realistic. I mean, and it's, and it's just the perpetual cycle that people are put in to these yo-yo, yo-yo cycles because they're succumbing to all the fad diets, all the products, all the like, the quick magic pill, the quick fix, and the reality is, the path to Allah, there's no pill for the quick fix. So with your body, same thing. it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple. Keeping it simple, like you said, gradual, and like you said, I mean, a really important point is, you know, when we talk about, like, or I was talking about those mental hurdles mm -hmm. uh, that, that people often have, it, it's, it's don't let the, or don't let the perfect get in the way of the one hundred percent. Right. It's like we we want to. We, yeah, we want to ideally spend an hour in the gym. Okay? Paralysis by analysis. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's a new one. Paralysis by analysis. I like that. Um. Yeah. And so we overthink it. And so it's like, you know, what? 10, 15 minutes is a start. It's something. Don't let you know the hurdle of wanting to do an, an hour uh, necessarily stop you from doing anything. Yeah. Like I recommended to a few sisters that really it just was like. I can't do it consistently. I said, listen, five minutes after each prayer, that's it. Just do, I would give, okay, here, do like two or three moments right after each prayer. You pray five times a day. The sajana, the prayer mat, it's good enough. That works as a mat. Do two or three movements, done. And then do that over five prayers. There you have 20 minutes of movement. It doesn't have to be all in one time frame. It's cumulative. The body's not gonna say, oh, you only did 10 minutes, sorry, it didn't count. I mean, it's what you do throughout a 24 hour period. The body has its natural cycle. So moving past like, you know, overcoming the sedentary tendencies that we have in modern life, um, you know, bringing it back to nutrition then, 
Um, you know, and you've mentioned fat diets, right? I mean, right now, like the latest trend could be, I don't know, um, what was it, the intermittent, intermittent fasting? Oh. Sorry? Hold on. What? Sorry. I'm, I'm oh, not a fan of yeah. oh, fat diet. Fat, fat diet. Well, you know what? I mean, you're going to pick on intermittent fasting. I mean, just to say, listen, fast for the sake of a lot. Right. Any other fasting is not going to help you in the grave. Right. So, so then what do you say to people? Lot, lot. So what do you say, uh, like, in terms of then diet, like focusing on the right kind of diet? Um, like, you talked about meat. That was something you touched on. Yeah. I'm assuming there that you found something in the prophetic tradition yes. where the consumption of meat. And yes. Kind of so if we had to classify the type of diet that the Prophet Sallallahu had, he was a partial vegetarian. So meat was a luxury. Mm. It was as if he, if he was visiting someone's home, there was meat. Otherwise, there was not going to be any meat at his house. Based from the few Hakims that I have studied with and by consensus, okay, if you're going to eat meat, at least keep it to one time a day. Um, and if you can keep it to one time a day, meaning at one meal only, okay, then if you can reduce it back to two to three times per week, alhamdulillah. And definitely, if it's not grass-fed, you are just ingesting so many chemicals, antibiotics, steroids, that it's just so toxic to your body. And if you want to have halal, it's got to be tired too. One doesn't go without the other. So you need both. So at this point, quality over quantity. Quality over quantity. And, and for those, you know, who listen, you know, we've had uh, yeah, Imam Dawood Yassin on the show, you know, hashtag get your own halal. So, you know, um, he, he eats only that meat that he's able to hunt himself and, you know, clean and purify. So there's that. And then, you know, he, he's focused on this idea of, you know, the, the, uh, the, um, the imperative in the Quran about diet or about meat in particular is not only that it qualifies as halal, which tends to be the sort of overwhelming focus of everything because it's legal or, you know, and, and our obsession with law, but it's also the qualitative uh, virtue of being fayyab, like you said, pure as well as being halal. And that's often forgotten in this conversation. Yeah, the meat may qualify based on the guidelines of Sharia to be slaughtered in a proper way, and that it's halal, but is it like a brain? And like you said, the hormones, um, just the, and then, you know, something you didn't touch on, but I know something that I know you would value is also how are the, the, the ethical treatment of the animals? 100%. Right? And, and, and what that does to an animal as it's being, you know, slaughtered, and, and just that kind of trauma, um, you're, you're, you're consuming that. Right. And the energy is neither created nor just thrown. Yes, no. So. Or even this, even just eating out mm. the state of the person cooking your food. Many of our scholars, senior scholars, will not just eat at the hands of anyone, let alone at a restaurant. Because do we know the state of the person, the iman of the person? Do they pray five times a day? We don't know. I mean, were they even able to do? Because when we pray, rather when we cook, we want to cook with baraka. Even if it's a little bit of food with baraka, make wudu before you're going to cook. Make uh, a dua, make, make your intentions, our actions are by intentions. And then recite some salawat, recite some Quran, some dhikr while you're cooking. Something so simple so that that baraka transfers the state to the food. So there's so many variables. But we have to, you know, strive little by little, striving like, oh, okay, just a little bit more. And like you said, I mean, you know, going back, to, it's the same idea of like modern convenience is all about time and efficiency. So it's like forget about you know farm to plate. It's 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 now like grocery store to plate, and how can we minimize the amount of time it takes for me to be able to even prepare a meal again? Because people's schedules are so limited, right? So. But you're here in the Bay. You guys really have. I mean, listen, raw milk is legal. It's illegal in New York. Really? Yes. Normally, I come here. I hate that. So uh, like the health code. My wow. dear host has probably heard this story. Will be the first thing I usually do when I get off the plane. But I had to go speak at Zaytuna, so I didn't do what I normally do: is run to Sprouts or Whole Foods, 
and run to the dairy section and grab a half gallon of raw milk so I could just spend four days going like this with it. Go, 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 because it's legal. <laughs> it's contraband. Legal. There's a black market of raw dairy in New York. Take some yeah, well, they'll like probably arrest me at, at security. That's right. So, did you, please qualify though. What, what, what do you mean when you say raw milk? Not pasteurized. Mm -hmm. And what are the benefits of it for that? It Why has it? all its enzymes. The only reason people have lactose intolerant issues is they've been pumped with pasteurized milk and dairy That's probably the entire life and also. also the chemicals and processed foods mm -hmm. since it, from a very young age i mean i see parents, nothing wrong but i mean i see parents giving table food to children when their digestive systems really haven't fully developed they're not going to be able to digest it so they will develop a food allergy mm -hmm. so it comes back to what are we giving even our children, you know, especially under the age of two, their digestive systems really aren't fully developed. So raw, unpasteurized milk. Now, is there a, pre is there a preparation that one, one has to do? To no, no. Here in California, you buy it right off the shelf. And, and it has the cream mixed in and everything. Oh, that that's there. wonderful. And if, if you haven't, you know, you can't take that big step you have incredible local grass-fed, non-homogenized milk that the cream is at the top as well. So, for those who are still like, oh, but everybody, pe more people die by the interaction of different medications than they will ever have anything happen because of raw milk. <laughs> so, why is it illegal in, in New York? Lobbyists. The dairy industry, I'm sure they have very powerful. Big milk. Yeah. Big milk. <laughs> yes. Wow. Um, so I, I guess then, uh, you know, to as we kind of uh, wrap up the show, um, you know, with, with Ramadan approaching, then what are some advice or, 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 step or tips that you can give for people in terms of probably good foods to focus on, both at the time of suhoor as well as the time of breaking the fast if far, and then also. Um, you know, overcoming the dehydration, especially in these long, hot days. We'll take it straight to the prophetic tradition. As the Lord, number one prophetic inspired food to have is watermelon. It's very hydrating, and dehydration is an issue for so many people. Stick to the very hydrating fruits. Um, also, the prophetic drink, which is well, how I make the prophetic drink is seven Ajwa dates soaked overnight. And why the seven Ajwa dates? Because the person that eats seven Ajwa dates first thing in the morning is protected from any evil. So we're getting like a little more extra sunnah there. And if you have zemzem water, a splash of zemzem, again, let's just layer those sunnahs. That healing is just, you know, there's just not enough to go around, so why not? Yeah. Um, give it a try if you ever have if you have any challenges with distraction or waswas -was or anything, seven Ajwa dates first thing in the morning is like a shield. You do not feel anything up until Monday, of course. That's the day. Are you allowed to soak for how long? Um, I recommend like mid asr to say sohoor time or if it's not Ramadan till you wake up. Uh, if it's going to be left out, more than 14, 12, 14 hours, I would put in the refrigerator. It can last for like a day or two. Then it would start to ferment. So we say, try to, you know, avoid. Can you get a little buzz off of it? Well, you know. Is the fermentation strong enough? I don't know. It gets a little fuzz, fizzy, fizzy. <laughs> just making sure. Yeah. Uh, so okay. I have that on my social media. I just, yeah. uh, I always post about it over and over. Because, you know, as the teachers say, it doesn't matter if you hear a story over and over and over again, because there's always going to be something that you take differently. So we should just say, like, oh, I heard that already. Oh, I knew that already. Oh, I did that already. There's always something new that you're going to get, because your state is ever-changing. Uh, so the prophetic drink, uh, watermelon, any of the hydrating uh, fruits. As the Quran says, the right? Like, there's Exactly. Even if you're reminded. Huh? Exactly, exactly. Alhamdulillah. And then in terms of hydration, a lot of people have trouble and struggle with 
water. So something also salt is from the prophetic tradition, not white table salt. We're going to go with the best possible salt possible that is available. Pink Himalayan salt has 84 essential minerals that the body needs. Put a pinch of pink Himalayan salt in your water. That is the healthiest hydration you can possibly have. That's a healthy Gatorade. Uh, and when I say a pinch, let's just say you have a liter, a pinch. Uh, so that helps. So it's pink Himalayan salt. It's like you're not pink rub so. Mm. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah. As a second option, a really good sea salt, but really pink Himalayan salt. Okay. And you want to make sure you have a good product because, the, let's see, pink Himalayan salt, uh, honey, uh, olive oil, ajwagates, there's a black market for all of these things. So you really have to know what you're buying. Okay. You may not get what you think you're buying, especially. You know, you're like, oh, that's a cheap one. I mean, the reality is, unfortunately, this is what we're dealing with. So you need to know what you're buying. I was fascinated. Yeah, I was just reading something today, I think, about how maybe over 70% of the honey that you can buy at, at like grocery stores is not, it's no. just watered down honey. It's but like, again, you're in the bay. Then, there you go. Go find the beekeepers or the local farmers or the farmers markets. Really support your local agriculture so that they can thrive. So these are things that are beneficial. And so with that said, uh, you can have coconut water, you can have, and the prophetic drink, hands down, this is gonna be my 11th Ramadan. I've not found anything more hydrating and sustaining than the prophetic drink. Again, everything from the prophetic tradition is dependent upon the degree to which you believe in the prophet So there's no placebo there. <laughs> there's no placebo, I like that. Right. Um, and then, um, what about, um, uh, you, you talked about dates, hydration, um, and then I guess, you know, one of the other things that people often complain of, or, or one of the uh, one of the sort of symptoms, I should say, that one faces in Ramadan is a lack of sleep and getting that kind of soul. How do you maybe overcome some of the, or for those the of us like... The pink Himalayan salt, what happens with whether you're dehydrated or sleep deprived, you're also not going to have the nutrients to contend with your daily activities. Right. So even if it's a caffeine withdrawal headache, I was gonna say, the headache actually comes from dehydration more than it will come from the uh, lack of caffeine. Yeah. Dehydration will be like, you're, we die within three to four days if we don't have water. Right. We can live without food for over a month. So really addressing hydration and, and if pink Himalayan salt is still not enough, you can also infuse your water with some cucumber slices, which is also from the prophetic tradition. It's very hydrating. Add something like if you don't like plain water, because water alone isn't always the most hydrating. Have hydrating foods. Try to avoid dry foods, because dry foods need water to digest. They might be an ideal food outside of Ramadan, but in Ramadan, dry foods will dehydrate you more. And then also, as another possibility, um, you can add a good hydration powder. Like a, like let's just say when someone goes to Hajj, or really Hajj, they recommend, like they'll say, like the noon tablets, something like that. But you want to avoid a product that has a lot of chemicals. So, that will actually help you for the person that doesn't really like to drink a lot of water. Okay. And then if tar, really quick, keep it moderate. Eat more or less. I personally eat exactly the same way I eat full year in Ramadan. Obviously, minus one meal. So you, if you radically change the foods you ingest during the Ramadan, you will have a greater reaction. Gas, repeating, burping, heartburn, all of that. And then finally, um, you know, um, you talked about uh, being active and, and, and you know being you know, staying physically active in Ramadan. Any recommendation tips there? Walk as much as you can to help your digestion and to keep your body and circulation optimal, and also keep you mobile. If you don't, if you're not familiar with how to, uh, and I don't want to use the word stretch because in my world we use mobilize. Stretching again makes people think, okay, you're going to do a split and you're going to just stick your leg out. That's from the 80s. Um, we don't do that. As professionals, half of what you see on social media, yeah. real professionals, don't do any of that. Uh, 
Like if you work one on one with a real professional, no one does any of that. Like everything you see is like for the brand, so to speak. Um, I would really emphasize flexibility, foam rolling, maybe some yoga, walk, 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 walk. And if you are somebody that resistance trains, resistance training two to three, four days, but you know, is Ramadan about workout or is it about Allah in the, in the Quran? So balance. You want to maintain. You want to maintain your body tone. You want to maybe lose a little bit of weight. You just have to just stay, uh, you know, moving. Just simple movement. Nothing that has to be so complicated. Ciao. Nice. Well, thank you so much for this really enlightening conversation. I have to be honest. I feel like a little bit like this was this entire conversation was just perverse, passive aggressive way of sending me specifically a message. It is. It was, it was a message received. I get it. It was a conspiracy. No more Pringles for dinner. I got it. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, Sister Zana, for, for uh, you are most welcome. coming and talking. Let's please give her a big hand. Thank you. Welcome to Diffuse Congruence Live. We are in Michigan. My name is Zaki Hassan. I'm here with Pervez Ahmed celebrating the American Muslim experience, uh, continuing our Michigan tour. That's right. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, for me, it's kind of being back home. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I lived uh, not too far from here in Canton, and uh, where I used to actually work at a part when, when I was in grad school. I worked part time in Taylor, which is not which is right next door to where we are right now. Uh, but yeah, it's good to be back in Michigan and good to be back with uh, fellow Michiganders. And uh, yeah, uh, would like to. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about today because this is sort of an unusual thing. Not only because it's a live episode. Uh, but also because we're doing kind of a panel conversation today. So this is going to be like... This uh, is the first time we've ever done this. That's right. It's a big right. deal. <laughs> You're right. So, and um, also a big deal is the panelists that we have. So maybe Zucky kind of maybe go down the table and uh, introduce everybody. Yes. Well, well, uh, we are joined uh, for this uh, special discussion with uh, Naja Bazi, who is founder of Zaman International, which is uh, where we are recording the show right now. She's CEO of Diversity Specialists and Transcultural Healthcare Solutions. She's a global leader in medical ethics, philanthropy, nursing, and interfaith dialogue. We're also joined by Daoud Walid, who is executive director of the Michigan chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations and is a member of the Michigan Muslim Community Council Imams Committee. 
And uh, lastly, but not leastly, we have Mark Crane, uh, co-founder of Empower Change, a rapid response digital campaigning organization serving the Muslim community. And he is the project director for Dream of Detroit, a Muslim-led community development initiative on the west side of the city. So, uh, Pervez, what is our umbrella topic for uh, assembling this this uh, this real Justice League uh, that we've brought together here. Yeah, um, I mean, I think we could we, we can go about it in I think one of several ways. Um, uh, you know, typically for those again, like for the listening audience, you know that we we generally like to capture people's sort of origin story. You know, uh, what brought them to where they are today? To uh, you know, what brought them to the work that they're doing today? What inspired them? And I think we can certainly do a part of that. Um, but I think that you know, if there is going to be sort of a uh, umbrella theme, if you will, or an uh, overarching theme to today's conversation, um, I actually kind of wanted to use, um, you know, Daoud, Imam Daoud's work um, and his, you know, recent book on uh, towards sacred activism kind of to, uh, um, uh, to, I guess, anchor the conversation around uh, just activism, social justice issues that are related to that. And, and certainly, uh, it's one of the areas that Imam Daoud does explore in the book. Um, but I think, um, you, know, you know, if I could ask you, uh, Imam Daoud, to kind of maybe speak to what was sort of the impetus for why you wrote the book and what you hope to sort of highlight in terms of, if you will, objectives or a conversation that you wanted to start within the Muslim community about issues of activism and how that relates to our uh, sacred, tradi- sacred tradition. Well, first of all, let me say it's a pleasure to be here uh, on you, uh, with you on Diffuse Congruence. And I've listened to your podcast, and it's one of the podcasts in the community that I listen to. So may Allah reward you both and protect you for the work that you've uh, Thank you. been doing. I actually was playing for the third time the podcast that you did with my good friend, our good friend, Brother Ali. I was playing <laughs> that for my son, Adam, uh, a couple of days ago, actually. So awesome. alhamdulillah. Um, so the, the impetus for myself uh, writing the book Towards Sacred Activism actually uh, is a project that I worked on for uh, quite a while as far as uh, research and condensing things, also speaking to scholars, including some of my teachers, uh, both here in America as well as in West Africa. Uh, but what sparked for me to... Uh, say we need to address the, the activism scene. It starts off with a um, a cohort that I was part of. Mm-hmm. And it was, let's say, about seven years ago. And I was in a cohort which has had uh, several different uh, cohorts uh, that started. And it's basically a lot of the who's who of the activist world in the uh, Muslim mm-hmm. community. And what I saw is people who are very sincere, who were treating activism as uh, something that is bound up in primarily secular framework, secular uh, epistemologies really coming from the the left. And um, instead of seeing activism as something part of the Islamic faith, I felt that what I was seeing is people making activism a religion, Hmm. a dean. Sure. Right. Uh, in which uh, then certain uh, means can justify what is considered to be a noble end. Right. Mm-hmm. So uh, I saw a number of things that really uh, bothered me uh, through that cohort. So that is what uh, sparked. It. Actually, I went and I started. Basically, I rang a bell. I met with, with, with a number of scholars. I'm not going to mention their name, but after, during it uh, and afterwards, actually, with Dr. Jackson, probably the first person I actually spoke to, I will mention that, uh, in terms of like what I saw going on, mm-hmm. right? And um, some of my concerns of what I saw happening or why I saw the community and the activism scene going with the uh, the call-out culture, the lack of uh, parameters, um, the uh, disrespect that I see of our scholarly tradition in many terms. Um, I saw it maybe about two years afterwards. I've seen it start taking a downward snowball in mm. the past, like mm. four or five years in particular. Yeah. Uh, so. 
You, you know, it's interesting because I mean, I, and I think you, you're, you're alluding to certain things that I, I, you know, I think we can maybe delve into a little bit further. Um, because I, you know, I've often said, like, as a as a child of or a product of uh, coming of age in '90s Islam in America, um, and that whole scene and the conversations that were happening. I felt like, you know, um, that was still a time in our history where, you know, we, we were talking about issues like is the, you know, the permissibility of music and eating outside the non the biha meat or, you know, the intermingling or the, uh, you know, segregation of the genders and so on. And, I, I, you know, these conversations were almost glacial in terms of like we were still talking about it like 20, 30, 40 mm-hmm. years down the road. And I'm not necessar- necessarily saying that that's the place to be. However, I juxtapose that from conversations that have happened more recently where, you know, for example, you know, conversations around LGBTQ and whether or not Muslims should align themselves with left-leaning causes or causes that, um, you know, may, one may certainly argue are compromising or are, um, you know, perhaps even antithetical to uh, Islam and Islam's tradition. And yet those conversations, I feel, lack not only the nuance, but have lacked that kind of glacial, like, let's, let's really kind of talk about this issue from the van, you know from the various vantage points and look at it and, and see it from not only from a strategic and an ends versus or an ends justifying the means sort of approach but also from a is this in is this in congruence if you will with our tradition and yet that hasn't happened and it's been this sort of rushing to um, you know embracing certain uh, certain um, you know like you said epistemologies or approaches to activism so I mean what why do you think that has been the case I mean I think certainly post nine eleven and and what has happened to the community, and I think uh, coupled with and if you, and I would love for for you to comment on whether you agree with this framing, but coupled with the fact that um, the 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 right in America, the conservative, uh, uh, the conservative part of the political scene, um, has uh, aligned itself with forces that are not only alien and antithetical to Muslims. Uh, but see us as a real threat and as a real fifth column in this country. So maybe that sort of all has snowballed together to kind of cause the kind of, uh, I, I guess, rushing to embracing these causes that we see without, you know, a real nuanced conversation. Yes, I think there's a, a few things in it. I'll just try to address succinctly. And I know we have two. Uh, I know exactly uh, people on the uh, on the uh, panel who are very uh, capable of discussing and elaborating as well. Um, but part of the impetus also of myself writing this book is to help start a conversation, right? And I actually, I mentioned in the book that I actually walk in critique, and I hope that <laughs> someone takes the the book and critiques it and actually improves, right? But that uh, there hasn't been any sort of book that was written uh, delving on this discourse from our Asuli tradition, mm-hmm. right? That um, it's, it's, it, it, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a a first, and this is like when I asked Imam Zaid, uh, uh, Shaka, may Allah preserve him, mm-hmm. uh, when I asked him to to write this, and he was, uh, I was discussing the, the contents, he was very uh, excited. But I think that some of this uh, does, uh, in the activism scene, does relate to a, a reaction, and it's a also a generational difference with inside the community. Uh, a lot of it is uh, formed by post-9-11 uh, community discourse and ourselves seeing ourselves as in a, in a crisis type of mode. I mentioned that and elaborate on that some within the introduction of the book. Mm-hmm. But I think it's also a little something that even goes deeper of the lack of tarbiyah mm-hmm. or the lack of Islamic education and grounding that people have had, which then they go into uh, activism and they feel compelled almost as if everything is intimate, everything deserves an immediate reaction that it has to be uh we have to jump and do this right now right um and i want to quote something that i brought this because this kind of speaks to a matter relating to activism which i believe is rooted in the concept we have in islam of uh, enjoining the mahroof or enjoying the good and for being the evil that's really the basis of activism and sidi ahmed uh, azaruk uh rahmatullah alayhi, a great uh, moroccan uh, maliki scholar he said that, and this is for those of you who have his book on Qawa'ad uh, Tasawwuf, mm. in the, uh, the 79th uh, principle, or Qa'ida, he says that it is not permissible for anyone to proceed in the matter except that 
they know the ruling of Allah pertaining to that matter, right? Mm. So this is part of like, if we're going to enjoin the good and forbid the evil and we look at a particular issue, we have to first be humble and have to submit ourselves, okay, well, what is the Islamic ruling, right? What is the general basis of how uh, not only the outcome that we're working towards and whether it's something permissible, whether it's something recommended, but also involved in the shura process is the means and the adab or the etiquettes of helping to implement this, which we think is going to promote good in the society Mm -hmm. or permit uh, or forbid the evil. Mm -hmm. Does it jive with inside the Sharia, which means that we have to have some sort of knowledge. We just can't have activism from feeling right. It like, and I feel that we are in a type of, we're in the age of feeling right now. I feel a certain way. I, I'm sincere, but as one of my as one of my uh, teachers said, uh, Imam Salim Al Rahman Rahmatullah Alayhi, he he told me in one session. He says, Daud, you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong, <laughs> and this is why we need tarbiyah. Mm-hmm. We need uh, and we need to have spiritual guidance, uh, spiritual mentors, mm-hmm. and take shura. But it has to be within the in the framework of the general mm-hmm. principles of the Quran, Sunnah, and the consensus of what Muslims, Sunni, and Shia have always agreed upon. Like there, there are many matters that the Muslim community is different upon, but there are certain things that are non negotiable. That there is right. there is ijma on. Like it's, like everything is not up for democratic vote hmm. uh, within the like our ethics and values aren't up for right. democratic. What we refer to as manum minadin bidurura, like known. No manum minadin bidurura. That's right. That's right. So what known of our religion out of necessity, so or the non-negotiables, as you said. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, and I think I, I, I don't want to. You mentioned Imam Zaid. Um, it would be remiss not to say a little bit, a few words about the book, real quickly. Um, uh, a beautiful forward by Imam Zaid Shakir, former guest of the show, of course, um, uh, and mentor to the show in many ways, and, and of course our our very own. Uh, uh, Lena Safi. Instead of Lena, is, that's is right. In the, in the house a future right now. guest of the show. So, <laughs> a future guest of the show, uh, Lena. And, uh, but yeah, and, and people can find the book uh, through meccabooks.com. Meccabooks.com. So, yes. thank you. Um, but yeah, uh, if I could bring in, like you mentioned, I'd love to you know bring in our uh, other co-panelists to this conversation. Um, you know, maybe if I could start with you, you know, Naja, since one, I want to thank you again for hosting us in your uh, wonderful facility here at Zaman. Um, but maybe uh, if you could maybe pick up the conversation from where uh, you know Imam Dawood left us in terms of in what informs. Kind of the work that you've done. I mean, you've been someone who has been involved in the community, you know, mashallah, for decades. Um, you know, if I can have a, a little confessional moment, first time I, I ever saw you was in fact here in Michigan um, at the world premiere of uh, Muhammad, you know, uh, Legacy of the Prophet. Uh, right? What was the name of the doc? Uh, the, the, I, Michael I, Wolf. I, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. And, and you were one of the people featured in that in that documentary, and that was right after nine eleven. And it was it was really a wonderful uh, uh, documentary film by Michael Wolf and Alex Cronenberg. But um, maybe if you can kind of talk about you know your work, uh, not only as a as someone involved in the healthcare industry, you know, as a nurse, um, and but what sort of led to the work that Zaman is doing, and 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 why. Um, you know, how, how that's related to, I guess, you know, some of the work that you were doing prior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And, and I want to thank all the organizers. And Zaman is not my place. Zaman is everyone's place. <laughs> and I think that's really, that is part of the activism, mm. is the mindset of how you build an organization and who does it belong to. Yeah. And does it really align with the sacred mission? Uh, whether that is Islam or anything else, does right. it align with humanity? Right. And does it align with nahi an al munkar, as Imam Dawood said? Yeah. And 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 can it breed goodness? Because wherever there is goodness, you will find more goodness. Just like wherever there is evil, you can find more evil. Mm-hmm. But in terms of um, kind of the what moves the heart in terms of this work, it actually I think. I think about this a lot. I think it's really, um, to Dawood's point, the way that I was raised. Mm. And I think all credit really goes to my family. Very open-minded parents, one Sunni, one Shia, that raised us with a house full of love. 
that took in refugees before refugee resettlement was a thing, mm. that always fed people in our home before they fed us, that m- walked for muscular dystrophy, knocking on doors because my brother had muscular dystrophy, even though they couldn't speak one word of English, and still went to our mosques and actually built them. Right cooking and and serving. And this idea of service is something that we were raised with. And my father was a serviceman. He served in the military of the United States of America. And I kind of chuckled a little bit when you talked about um, being raised with Islam, like in the 90s, while I was being raised in the 60s. Um, So you really dated me there. No, Um, no, no. But but that's okay. I was a little bloomer. Let's just put it that way. So You're all either my younger brothers or sisters and and sometimes even my children. You know, Nadja, like like we sit here miles away from, you know, Dearborn. And I think, you know, like your own unique sort of history um, and connection to Southeast Michigan, I think that I I would really like for you to kind of get into that. And I think you were with, 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 with your father's background. But, um, you know, so you were you were a, a child of immigrants here in Southeast Michigan. My mom and dad were actually born here. Okay, so raised th- over in Syria and in Lebanon, and then came back like hmm. the American dream um, uh-huh. by parents who were willing to bring them in a, in a boat ride that took you know a couple of months to get here. But my point is, and this may rub people the wrong way, I don't see a disconnect. I don't see a discongruence. I see the congruence mm. between being American and being Muslim. Right. Mm. I don't Absolutely. have a problem with that. Absolutely. We, were, we, we, were, we weren't raised to have a problem with it. So for me, being part and parcel of this country is a very natural thing to do. Mm. I don't see that Zaman has to be a Muslim organization. I see that Zaman is a sacred organization that can serve all people. But when you, when you ask the question about what really stirs the the activism, I really think it's this hadith that I'm always playing in my mind. Mm. If you see an injustice, I talked about a Muhammad legacy. I'm always talking about this. Yeah. You must fix it with your hand. And if you cannot fix it with your hand, you must speak out against it with your tongue. And if you cannot speak out against it with your tongue, you must condemn it in your heart. In the third pathway is the weaker of the other two. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there is a call to align. Now, when Imam Dawood talks, I I listen. (laughs) And um, I made a note um, when he was talking about... She's a mentor of mine, by the um, way. (laughs) Just keep that in mind. (laughs) When I talk, she listens. She is my mentor. I'm not exaggerating by saying that. (laughs) Well, you're talking about sacred activism, and I keep thinking about what does that really, really mean? And I think it really means sacred alignment. And I think when we stand before God and we put our hands up to our ears and we do Allahu Akbar and we push this world away and we come to God, Mm -hmm. I think that sacred alignment should drive all things. Now, you talked about the left and the right, and I want Mark to yeah, know, exactly. weigh in here. But-, but I wanted to ask you really quickly before we move, like, if you could define a little bit further maybe sacred alignment. Do you mean like as human beings aligning with the sacred? Is that- yes, okay, exactly. Okay. Right, right, right. I mean, if everything, according to our scripture, mm-hmm. if everything in every atom bows to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mm-hmm. A-T-O-M, if everything knows God, then... There shouldn't be the polarities that we have. Hmm. If there is respect for the divine, Hmm. then everyone deserves equity. If Mm -hmm. there's respect for the divine and we know who's created all of us as a human family and the diverse colors and languages and even religions and even a lack of religion. Nabi Ibrahim, he was dining with an atheist. And when he found out he was an atheist... He dismissed the atheist, and God sent Jibreel right down to Ibrahim and said to him, feed him. I know he does not believe in me, and I continue to provide his sustenance. Call him back. Mm. But we're not hearing those stories anymore. Mm. We're, not, we're not paying attention to the connectedness mm-hmm. that we all have. And so I'm a firm believer that I know where I am going. I'm going right into the ground and the earth And I will be there. And so I need to be of it and a part of it. So I'm not one who's either left or right in the issues because I believe that Islam coming, if we were to, even though it is the beginning, the middle, and the end of the divine message, 
I believe that that message, the voice of that message leaves room for, for everyone. Even those that we may find fault with, mm-hmm. Allah may be merciful with. So at least at the very minimum, rather than shut the door on people, Mm -hmm. at least be merciful enough to feed, clothe, and shelter them Mm -hmm. at a basic level. That's right. At least that. Right. And then wherever people fall on issues, I mean, I have my own personal opinions about things that are happening in this country, very strong opinions, but I also find that the mizan of of Islam, Mm -hmm. that balance, balance, Uh it actually has answers. But we're not looking for those answers mm. because oftentimes the agenda and the podium is about the person, mm. not about the divine. And, and that is very dangerous. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and I, and I want to come back to like, like more specifically the work that Zaman is doing because I do want to highlight that. But um, but before we do that, I mean, I, I want to bring in Mark and join and have Mark, Mark Crane join the conversation as well. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us and taking the time out. Um, and and if you could, you know, maybe uh, if you want, I mean, feel free to respond to anything that um, either Naja or Imam Dawood have have stated so far. Uh, or if you'd really like to kind of talk about the work that Dream of Detroit does, because I'm I'm really excited to hear about that um, as well, and I think our listeners would be equally you know, excited to hear about the work that you're doing there. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, Alhamdulillah, that's a, that's a softball he just pitched me. So that's, I, can, <laughs> I can talk about Dream. Uh, I'll say that um, you know we can play hardball a little no, later. I, you know, right, once yeah. we warm <laughs> up a little bit, I got to be warming warm you up. You know? yeah. That's right. We're just warming uh, you up. So. I, I will say that yeah. you know, Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm I'm glad to be on the podcast with you all, and I uh, I agreed to to join the podcast when a dear friend asked me, but I was not originally told that it'd be a panel with Sister Najah and Imam Dawood, and and I may have I may have seriously reconsidered. Uh, <laughs> I've known that. This is quite, I'm very honest about that. So, um, but I but I am. Uh, grateful to be here and i can i can certainly talk about the work that we're doing with dream of detroit mm-hmm. um, or that we're trying to do with dream so uh so dream is an organization that's been around for um a little over five years now uh closer to six um it's an organization that for much of that time i've sort of been the primary volunteer of but i actually wasn't i wasn't here when the idea was originated i was actually still in chicago um and I was connected to one of the founders of Dream because they were a supporter of the work that we were doing at Eman, the Inner City Muslim Action Network okay. in Chicago, which I know a lot of people will be more familiar with. Mm-hmm. So I worked there for a, a brief while, a couple of years. Uh, Although, are you originally, you hail from Michigan? Yeah, or I'm from Detroit. Chicago? Yeah, oh, I'm from, from the east side of Detroit. That's right. uh, I was born on the west side, raised on the east side. Uh, and the whole city is mine. No, um, <laughs> uh, um, and, I, and I moved to Chicago, to the Chicagoland area for school and okay. then uh, became Muslim in my final year of college. Oh, uh, at Northwestern. At Northwestern. Okay, okay. And then uh, from there was blessed to to land a job shortly thereafter working at Iman, um, which I had just been introduced to right before I became Muslim. And so alhamdulillah, for a couple of years, I got to work sort of under the tutelage of Brother Rami Nashashibi and all the good people at that organization he's built. Um, and, then I, and then I left there and uh, got into uh, what I do today professionally, which is sort of digital campaigning and mm-hmm. mobilizing, um, and then came back home. Gotcha. Um, so when I came home, Dream was Dream. The, the folks at Dream had just finished rehabbing their first home uh, right down the street from the Muslim Center. Okay, uh, and it was a collaborative West side, effort. West side of Detroit. West side of Detroit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Muslim Center is a masjid that it, it's probably it, uh, technically not the largest in the city proper, but it's it's the largest that's considered kind of a Detroit masjid. Mm-hmm. Uh, there there are a couple of that are sort of on the border, but you know are sort of considered masjids of other cities. So. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and the Muslim Center has a 30-year really rich history that uh, it comes out of Imam of the Muhammad's community. Today is led by a Gambian scholar named uh, Sheikh Mamadou Sise and is really, mm. uh, you know, is, is in the process of really merging together several different strands of the, of the Muslim experience, if you will. Um, and, I, and, and I had a, a connection to the Muslim Center that I didn't really know about, actually, because uh, I think really since they were open, my family had been doing the locks at the Muslim Center. I come from a locksmithing family. So Imam Abdul El Amin, who was a founder there, goes way back with my grandfather and right. done a lot of business together over the oh. years. Um, so it was actually a non-Muslim at my locksmith shop who told me when I first came home, you should go to the Muslim Center. <laughs> so I'm doing that. Um, 
so 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 the project was really a coming together of, of elders from the Black Muslim community, particularly out of the Muslim Center at Masjid Wali Muhammad, the original Temple Number One of That's the right. Nation of Islam, and then uh, the Pakistani community, particularly out of the Western suburbs, uh, through a group called ICANN, the Indus Community Action Network. So Neighborly Needs and ICANN came together, right. and they did the Dream Project, which was this first home. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I came home right when they were for, sort of starting to look for the first tenant of that home, mm-hmm. and got involved, and and then we started to sort of figure out what the long term vision of the project was from there. So when you say Western suburbs, it's like Canton, Canton Michigan, Plant, yeah, Plymouth, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Canton's my old home, yeah, yeah where I live, but I'm okay, um, and, and, and I, I heard also through the grapevine, just if I could, um, uh, I think my youngest brother uh, went to the same high school as you did, so, Is right, that right? yeah, yeah, Cranbrook, so, yeah, yeah that's yeah, right, so. So, so, my, so my parents, uh, you know, drove me to Cranbrook from the east side of Detroit for seven years, that's 45 amazing. minutes amazing. I know that's I not a, world. that's not a small feat. No, it's not. No, no. <laughs> no it's not. As so. I'm learning, because I'm driving 30 minutes each way to Kenton <laughs> for, to take my kids to school. So we started earlier doing that than I anticipated, but alhamdulillah. Right. Um, but yeah, so just to wrap it up, though, the work yeah. of Dream is essentially bringing together uh, housing development, economic development, and community organizing to uh, rebuild the community around the masjid, um, and to and to revitalize that neighborhood. And and our and it's the goal is sort of twofold. It's one to build a healthy, thriving, Muslim led community in that area, but also beyond that to involve Muslims from throughout the metro region um, in, in the revitalization of Detroit's neighborhoods at large, and in sort of addressing some of the systemic issues that have made the neighborhoods look the way that they do today. Mm. <laughs> Wow, that's that's. Uh, I mean, I'm just I'm kind of blown away by by the breadth of of the work um, that our panel is doing, and mm-hmm. I think I think in terms of the broader topic that uh, you know we're discussing, which is this the the notion of of, of activism and uh, what that means uh, in this day and age, and and specifically uh, Imam Daoud. I mean, you were you were uh, talking about how activism has to some extent become a mantle that some people take on as a way. Not to speak for other people, but to sort of put, you know, propagate their own brand, so to speak, um, often at the expense of of our cultural tradition, our the our our scholars. I mean, one one thing I've seen, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is there's the sense of, oh, our scholars, they don't they don't know they don't know what it's like. They oh they they've been wrong. Like not, we're we are the new. Uh, keepers of the faith, if you will, and and that's something that you know Pervez can speak to. This this is a bee in my bonnet because it's just it's it's a lack of it's lack of decorum, uh, but above that it's it's a lack of self awareness. Um, and and uh, I wonder if you know when you when you talk about this idea of of uh, trying to strive towards sacred activism, mm-hmm. if that's you know that notion of the sacred being missing in in uh, uh, what we call activism today. Uh, well, it does exist amongst some, so I'm not going to say that it's a, a a complete desert. But hmm. from my perspective, there's uh, a lot of wasteland with only a few oases. Hmm. And I'm proud to say that Dream of Detroit and Zaman are actually some of those oases, at least here in the state of Michigan. Sure. And, and I'm saying that without any exaggeration. Um, I'd like to touch on uh, two things relating to what you, you said. The first is... Um, We talk about the difference between sacred activism and Muslims being involved Uh. in activism. Mm. Uh, Sacredness, that which is sacred, um, within it, it states that there are certain boundaries that Mm. can't be transgressed, like a haram or hurma. Like this is Mm. what we call something where there's a haram, there's a certain things that you should do more and there's certain things you can't do Mm. at a haram. Right. And then there's a certain way, there's certain rules, there's a certain adab, uh, decorum, and it's at a heightened level because you understand or the one who understands they're in the haram understands the harma or the 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 guidelines mm-hmm. and the sacredness of the of the area that they're in. Right. So when we talk about. And you're using that as a translation. I should, I should be yes, know, just yes. to be clear, like yeah. harm or oh, yeah, harma, harma as being sacred, as being exactly. sacred, exactly right. So yeah. like masjid al masjid al haram, right? The sacred sanctuary is the sacred yeah. sanctuary. Uh-huh. So there's individual human beings. We have we all have our our harma yeah. that we are given by Almighty God, and then Almighty God also uh, has given certain sanctity, which means that there are certain 
rights that uh, certain things are due, even if those things or those people don't necessarily afford us our rights, we still have certain rights that we have to afford individuals or certain people. And there's a and there's a and there's a guidelines uh, towards that. Now the other piece, and I mentioned uh, mentorship. I also think part of the problem, the disrespect of the scholars, uh, and, and we're not going to put all of the blame on on one side because we have, uh, first of all, we have uh, celebrity speakers that people think are scholars that aren't scholars in our community. That's the mm. first thing. Um, and then we uh, do sometimes have people who are uh, scholars who maybe don't understand cultural context of certain people and can say things that are insensitive. But generally... Uh, it is within our, our spiritual tradition, and I mentioned the retorbia or upbringing, mm -hmm. training, is that every activist uh, should have a spiritual mentor or a spiritual guide, hmm. right? They should, have, they should have a murabbi, or we can use the word murshid, whatever word we'd like to use, a sheikh, a uh, mustadha, uh, needs that uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is to be reminded of these sacred parameters, mm. right? So it should be either someone who's learned in the dean or at least an elder who's known to have upright character. But of course, the scholar, the knowledgeable person should also be known to have upright character. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that, and uh, as my friend, Dr. Bilal Ware, may Allah preserve him, uh, always discusses, I actually had a nice conversation with him yesterday and we were touching on, on some of this, but in, in Senegal, they have a saying that even even the sharpest sword cannot cut its own handle, right? Huh. Okay. So everyone needs some sort of uh, of, of of guidance, uh, and the nefs uh, the nefs by nature is prone towards self deception. So part of this is we need to be able to, uh, and we're not talking about blind following, but say, oh, okay. I don't know everything. I don't know all the answers. I need to go to an elder. I need to go to a scholar and just check in just for my own nef's sake, for my own uh, uh, ego sake, because the, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, problem for any activist, and I have a sheikh, by the way, I'm not going to be shy about saying that. I have a sheikh and I have someone I check in with at least once a week. Hmm. But um, in this whole endeavor in us of, of trying to check our, our nefs is that if we don't try to break our nefs, that it's very easy for an activist to fall into being sanctimonious or self-righteous. Because if you're always working and you think that the haq or the truth or the rights is always with you, I'm advocating for this right, I'm advocating for these people, you can be self-deluded and think that you are always right or actually you are the haq. That's right. right. And so this is why we need uh, spiritual uh, mentorship. And I think that any activist who is out in the public sphere, if they don't have a spiritual mentor, especially when, when, you're, when, when someone is younger, right, uh, I think this it leads to self-delusionment. And actually, the self-delusionment will take someone outside of the sacred parameters of the Sharia. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm convinced of it. I don't think anyone can do this activism thing right without teskia and without spiritual mentorship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I want to. I, I, there's a couple things I do want to come back to, which you just raised. But but before we get into it, I wanted to kind of go back to a point that you raised earlier, probably at the outset of the conversation, and and, and uh, you know, Sister Naja kind of echoed it with this idea of. Amr bin Ma'ruf wa Nahyan al Munkar. Okay, so the enjoining of the good and the prohibition or forbidding the evil. Uh, Ma'ruf, I mean, my understanding again, and please, Imam Dawood, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of the Ma'ruf as for, you know, within the discourse of the Quran is uh, thinking of it as a sociological term, that which is known to be of good, yes. that which is of known to be of value or benefit or, or, or goodness. Um, and I think that, you know, and, and again, and this kind of draws into a conversation you, or you started again or terms you've used about negotiables and non-negotiables. I think there's certain things that we can all agree on, re regardless of political stripe, regardless of, you know, Shi'i, Sunni, perhaps even our ideological frames. 
which is, look, feeding the poor, taking care of the disenfranchised, uh, the, the, the work that, you know, a dream, that the Dream of Detroit is doing, certainly the work that Zaman is doing. Look, this is stuff that we can agree on right out the box, um, you know, and so I think that, uh, you know, if you, expounding on kind of like that idea of the common good, Naja, if you could maybe speak to this about, you know, just because you, you raised this in your kind of introductory kind of comments about, like, look, I mean, I, you know, this work, people, like, I do this work because regardless of where you are, you're a human being and you have certain needs and, and, and you know, you, you need to be able to find a place where you can go to have some of those needs met, the need for shelter, for food, for community, perhaps, right? And so that's kind of the, some of the work that Zaman is doing. Well, it's even deeper than that. Mm-hmm. And it's deeper than that because the Quran is very specific the widow, the orphan, the wayfarer. There you go, right. Okay, the Quran does not say the Muslim widow, the Muslim orphan, the Muslim wayfarer. That's right. That's right. And when Allah created Adam, we know that Allah in Quran speaks. This is his voice speaking that says, I am creating the Khalifa on earth. The angels disagree, right? Or they, they're at least shocked. Let's call it that, whatever we want to call it, right? Yeah. Are you sure? Right. <laughs> you, know, you know what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. Yes, I know what they're going to do. But obviously, Allah knows the good in us too. But if we are khalifas to one another and for one another, that very deep sense, that is what's sacred. Any physician, any healthcare provider is not looking at the religion of the patient in the bed. That to me is so powerful that we are entrusted. We are trustees of one another. Now, I, I am scared for Islam in America when the wrong voices are at the podium, when voices of exclusively our Islam, exclusively our school of thought, exclusively this way and no other way, that is a dangerous zone to be there. The prophets were not like that. God is not like that. So this idea, especially in a diversity and inclusion world right now, mm-hmm. when, we, when we're touting this line of um, Islam is exclusively ours and, and inclusively ours, there is a danger in that. And so what I think is happening is a lot of people who go to a microphone or pick up a platform for activism, I think they're pushing against that. They don't like that. And so what they do instead is create a platform that has a little bit of a different voice that says, no, we, Islam is diverse. We're going to fight for this issue. We're going to fight for that issue. What's missing in their activism, again, I come back to the sacred alignment. You got to know your lane. I am not a scholar, but I have a teacher Mm -hmm every single day that I am in contact with. If I'm going to take the podium, I'm going to speak about women's issues or medical ethics or Islamic parameters around brain death, I had better know what I am talking about. I am a nurse. I am not a scholar. I did not study in the seminary. So knowing your lane Mm. is a sense of humbleness and it's humility. And to understand that there are those who have answers Maybe you don't agree with their answer, so go find it, go probe, research. And the other thing that's a little bit frightening to me is there is a sense, and it goes back to humility, there is a sense of self-righteousness, which kind of actually leads to that nafsi arrogance, that I am right. Mm, That's a tough place. I always tell people, whenever I think I've done something, I check myself. Is the minute I actually think I've accomplished something, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's the stop sign. Mm -hmm. Whenever I think I really know something for certain, that complete certainty, I should be a little bit afraid. I should just be Like a yellow flag. Like a yellow light. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Caution. When I'm on, when I'm secure, I know my dean. I have access to the scholars, just like they should have access to other scholars, just like they would go to a physician who is an expert in something. There you go. 
um, subspecialists. Even in the scholarship in Islam, there are all these subspecialists. Absolutely. But to think that I actually know means that I'm giving myself permission to speak. Mm. I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. I believe that alignment, um, and I, I've told many people in this audience, my, my grandmother says it best. She says in, in Arabic, it's a methal. She says a mm. proverb, like a, a, her, her yeah. own. She says, if you, if you toot your horn, your ears will hear it. <laughs> I like that. But if others toot your horn, uh -huh. the world will hear it. Wow. So there's a humbleness, I guess is what I'm saying, and a humility that comes from alignment with Allah. Mm. To know that He is the most powerful, He is the all-knowing. And we say that, we say He is the all-knowing, but sometimes we think we're the all-knowing. That is, it could be considered um, a subliminal slip mm. and even form of shark. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful. I'm not saying don't go out there and promote causes. Women should be doing this. Men should be doing this. Youth should be doing this. All I'm saying is the guidance is very critical. And what we say is often hard to take back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're in a very, um, you know, difficult time right now. So I, I, I think we have to put the lid on the id kind of a thing and, and really open our heart. Yeah. I know we have psychiatrists in the office and move forward <laughs> with that alignment. Yeah. So, no, I, I'm really glad that, like, you know, Doe, that you checked, you know, like, like you touched on the points that you did about, you know, self delusion and I think kind of believing in your own hype, which is kind of what you're talking about, Naja. But, um, you know, this idea of mentorship. Don't believe the hype like the old public, public enemy song. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> don't believe the hype. Yeah. Talk about 90s. Yeah. Coming of age in the 90s. Um, but, but more, you know, I, I think now, but also equally important uh, of, of something you raised, this idea of mentorship. And I think, you know, um, one, certainly one way of mentorship is what you described, which is like spiritual mentorship and you need that. But I think there's also, uh, when, you, when we talk about mentorship and certainly when we talk about organizations and activism and people do out there doing work and kind of knowing your lane, as it were, is, to, uh, is, is alignment, right? It, it is a different kind of alignment than you were mentioning, like sacred alignment or spiritual alignment with the divine. But, but, but aligning ourselves with other organizations that, can, that have done the work and have, and have been doing the work success, you know, successfully. Um, and so, Mark, I think, like given your background of, of having worked at Iman, right? Mm -hmm. An organization that has done just outstanding work um, in Chicago. Um, you know, how does that relationship continue with the work that you're doing here in Detroit? You know, like, for example, is that like the, le not, not only what you learned experientially, you know, experientially, um, in, at, you know, during your tenure at, at Iman, but also perhaps even on, on a current level in terms of your relationship with Rami or with the folks at Iman. I'd love for you to kind of talk about that. Um, one of the things, you know, we've mentioned Iman and, and certainly Rami and I have talked about the idea of having him on the podcast, mm -hmm. but that's going to happen. But I mean, you know, before we, so there, there's going to be yeah. definitely down the road an episode dedicated just to, to, to yeah. just that story. But I think having you and, and, you know, on the show, we'd be remiss not to kind of at least talk about some of the stuff that Iman's doing and how that has informed the work you're doing right here in Detroit. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it certainly has. Um, in, in a number of ways, you know, I'll, I'll say real quickly, uh, you know, when I first met brother Rami, I was not, or when I first learned of him, I wasn't Muslim, actually. Uh, I was in my last year of college, and the MSA was, was organizing an event. And, um, and a buddy of mine was sort of leading that process. And another friend of ours, brother of ours, had just organized a big BSU event and had brought Jeremiah Wright out. And this was right after uh, Barack Obama's election, and Jeremiah Wright had been in the news a lot. And so it was a, it was a very large event. And the, and the brother in the MSA felt challenged to, to sort of replicate. And so he, he invited uh, um, Bernadine Dorn and Bill Ayers. Uh, Bill Ayers, who was at the time, uh, he, if you, you might remember from the 08 cycle, people were saying that Barack Obama was palling around with terrorists. Right? Right. This was Bill Ayers. Right. He's a radical. And again, and like Jer you know, just maybe some of our listeners may not remember, but Jer you know, Jer Jeremiah, Jeremiah Wright was the Reverend Wright. The, yeah, yeah the, the Reverend the Wright. Reverend who, Wright who and of course, Bill Ayers, the yeah, yeah. Uh, and, underground. And, I and forget. Weather Underground. Weather, exactly. weather underground. He was a That's radical right. activist in the 60s, a part of an organization that uh, um, attacked federal infrastructure uh, as a means of rebelling against the war in Vietnam. 
Um, and in any case, I had studied social movements in college. And so I was quite interested in hearing Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn speak. Mm-hmm. And Rami Nashashibi was the third person on the program. And a lot of the folks in the MSA were, they were concerned. And they were like, you know, why, why would we align ourselves with this white guy that they're calling a terrorist? We don't need that. And and a buddy of mine, he said, well, why don't we ask Rami since he's the one who's got to be on stage with him? So they, they emailed Rami and he replied. Rami's known for like one sentence replies. And he replied, and she's like, yeah, I know Bill. He's great. I'll do it. And they had been on a board together or something. And so I walked into that event really to see Bernadine Dorn and Bill Ayers and left only remembering Rami Nashashibi and the incredible presentation he gave that evening. Yeah. And then, alhamdulillah, some months later, I got the chance to, to start working at Iman. I'll say that, you know, we um, Iman was very important for me as a young Muslim and, and as a person who had been involved in social justice work. Uh, it was It was a very good place for me to sort of reconcile the background that I was coming from with this new faith that I was entering. Um, uh, and particularly they had a, a, also a, and still have, you know, an emphasis on the arts as an organizing tool, which to me was very valuable. Um, and so, and so I learned a lot at Eman. And I, and I think for, you know, for a moment we thought about like, what would Eman in Detroit look like? There's an Atlanta chapter now. Um, Detroit is a very provincial place. I don't think I don't think we can't just import something like Eman to Detroit. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta be homegrown. And frankly, I had to, Prove myself over a number of years when I first got back here. I show up on the scene trying to trying to be all active, and people are like, "Who's this guy? We didn't we don't know him. He didn't come. He didn't grow up here." That's right. You know, I grew up working down the street from Master Wally Muhammad, actually, but had no real interactions. Um, and so, and also the work looked differently. So, any man, you know, Eddie Man, they have a free health clinic that's well regarded, and they do uh, a lot of organizing work, particularly around food access. Um, uh, you know, they do a lot of work in the arts. In Detroit, I was coming into a community that had a free health clinic that had been okay. running for some years, nice. uh, that had a masjid that literally has a cafe in it called the Halal Jazz Cafe. So I was not entering a community that had any sort of, you know, tension with the arts, necessarily okay. with engagement in the arts. Nice. Um, and our neighborhood looked much different than the very densely populated neighborhood on the southwest side of Chicago that Iman was working in. Right. And so um, for us, you know, the assessment was just that Iman's, Iman's direct model wouldn't necessarily work in our neighborhood. It didn't necessarily make sense, uh, let alone the, the branding issues and all those things. And so we had to step back and say, you know, what, it, what is important to do here? Um, and, the, and the most urgent thing was sort of solving the vacancy crisis in our neighborhood. Uh, and, then, and then, you know, in, in concert with that was creating a space for Muslims to move in the neighborhood because our, the masjid, frankly, is not one that I think historically has had a huge emphasis on people living around it necessarily. There's a faithful community that supports it, that drives in every Friday for Juma and different programs. But I don't think there was, a, you know, outside of a few people here and there who had come and gone, there wasn't a huge emphasis on really building a living community within walking distance to the masjid and sort of sustaining it like that. But but we came home, I came home at a moment where that was, where there, where there again, and there was this convergence of folks from several different communities at the Muslim Center, and that sort of spirit became much more important, but it needed to be facilitated. And so that's what we were and are continuing to try to figure out how to scale that. Um, I'll, I'll say, though, you know, uh, and to your question about, you know, uh, Rami, God bless him. I mean, Rami's the busiest man in America, you know, and I, I wish I had more access to his time. And I consider him a mentor and, uh, you know, but... Uh, you know, don't hold him accountable for any mistakes I make. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, you know, I'll say though, you know, part of the discourse around activism, around social justice work in general, um, that I find difficult sometimes is, is is just the definition of terms. And that's one of the things that I appreciate yeah. about Imam. There's a lot that I appreciate about Imam Dawood's book. Not to mention that in the first two pages, he, as he mentioned earlier. Uh, welcomes critique and conversation, mm-hmm. but also that he starts chapters, you know, uh, with the common practice for, from our tradition of defining terms, right? Like, let's make sure we're talking about the same things That's before right. we start to engage in a conversation. Um, you know, an activist is a an activist can be a number of things, but an activist can be a lone wolf. An activist can just be a person with an agenda. An activist can be a charismatic person that creates their own audience or that knows how to use mass media. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. I I wouldn't necessarily encourage folks in our community or particularly young folks to just go out and become activists. Uh, But I would encourage you to go out and become an organizer or to learn about organizing, which I think looks a lot different because an organizer is actually accountable to community, 
right? An organizer is, is in large part led by the people that they're organizing. An organizer trains and develops people. An organizer has to have a, a you know a political education, of course, and is and is and there's a sort of dialectic relationship with the people, but but ultimately, um, you know, organizers are are building something as opposed to just critiquing or as opposed to just a public analysis, and and organizing is much slower work than quote unquote activism. Mm. Uh, you know, I could I could put together a digital strategy that'll build you a following online very quickly. Right. Uh, I cannot hand. I cannot put together a strategy that is going to guarantee that you can build a community, or that you can bring together three hundred people of varying backgrounds and get them to align around a particular issue that they all consider a priority together, and then to move them toward acting on that priority. It's a much different type of endeavor. Mm. Um, and so, you know, that that's just one thing. And and then, you know, I think a lot of times uh, we talk about quote unquote left leaning causes and and. Quite often, it's it's like literally just a code word for LGBTQ agenda, and and but what happens is because we're afraid to say that, we end up painting this really broad stroke, and so you know, if all of a sudden racial justice work gets vilified, all of a sudden uh, work that critiques our economic structure gets vilified, mm-hmm. oftentimes vilified by people who are quite comfortable in this economic structure and in their own bubbles and have, and are not threatened by it. Speak on it. You know what I mean? And so, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, but to the work of dream, yeah. you know, we've, we've tried to, uh, to, to be in that common space that you were talking about and to, and to be as accessible to as many people as possible. And to go back to the point that sister Najah made earlier about, you know, uh, uh, shelter, clothing, and food. I mean, you know, that, that is one of the central hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we, that we talk about in our work, mm-hmm. you know, where he says that the, the right of Adam's, the, the rights of the son of Adam are, are not but three, uh, shelter to cover their head, clothing to cover their nakedness, and, um, food and water, food or in a piece of bread, mm. you know, and that's like, that is that, like, how can you disagree with that? How can you argue with that? Yeah. And so particularly that first part of the hadith around shelter, you know, is obviously our work around housing access is grounded in that. That's right. Yeah. If I can uh, add on uh, points to this beautiful commentary, I'd also like to mention uh, another group that's in our community who are activists, primarily not organizers. And I'm glad I mean, a lot of reward, Brother Mark, for that uh, clarification is that um, because I've been in and out of this uh, world and doing this work for quite a while, and many listeners may not know, um, there may be some naivety about some popular people in our community or how certain movements or organizations have come about uh, within our community that aren't grassroots, that actually outside people brought people into cohorts trained them a certain way, and then foundations funded certain people who did not have a national platform and actually magnified them. And once they got popular in the broader society, then they end up being uh, through uh, social media, uh, through getting a little buzz, got invited into Islamic conferences. The next thing you know, they're seen as being a leading activist voice on blah, blah, blah. But if you go and look at the money or look at how this person came about. Some of these people weren't grassroots activists. They really weren't doing that type of work that it was other people outside of our community who had an agenda who funded certain things and gave certain people platforms. Right. So I think that we, we can't be naive uh, uh, about this. It's not to say that foundation money is bad or evil. It also depends on the cause, but there is a difference between getting money to fund uh, feeding the poor, uh, for uh, medical care, uh, for shelter, and then also in the name of activism or anti-Islamophobia work in the name of intersectionality, then injecting things into there as being intersectional, as being part of what Muslims should be championing, where in fact goes outside of, 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 of certain, like, I'm not talking about things that we're just ikhtilaf on, right, amongst the jurists. I'm talking about qati'i issues, like things that are incontrovertible, because we have it, we have things that are dhani in our tradition, which are speculative, which the Islamic tradition is very broad. But again, I go back to this, there are certain things that the, 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 the Mu'tazila, and the Shia 
and the Ibadia, the El Ibadia, and Ahlul Sunnah. There are certain things that have always been agreed upon that cannot be propagated or cannot be advanced or to be normalized or talked about in a good way in the name of intersectionality. And some of this, some of this is, has gone on. And, and I think that as LGBTQ uh, is, is an issue that highlights this, which I actually devote one chapter to LGBTQ engagement in the book of not going to extremes about dehumanizing people who uh, see themselves as that, because that is a, a very un-Islamic extreme. But to actually champion it and wave the rainbow flag in the name of intersectionality or calling people allies and to say that, oh, you know, well, we need to make some space for people to talk about this as a positive identity with inside our massage, that's another extreme, right? Mm-hmm. And there are people who have funded people in our community to advance this. And, and, and I'm not going to be shy about saying it, though I'm not going to call out any uh, uh, individuals or, or, or foundations, but I, I know it firsthand, right? But that's because my organization has been turned down money because I specifically took a principal span, span uh, stand for Care Michigan that said, I'm not going to advance this just to get this uh, – Access to the fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollar grant from such and such foundation, such and such society. I just can't do it because, uh, um, and that's Abido Dunya's what Imam Hussein said that most people are slaves to a Dunya or, or Mal. I just can't prostrate to that money in the name of intersectionality. I, I, can't, I can't do it. And, 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 and I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to protect all of us from bowing down to money, right? bowing down to because I can be on this national platform or this national TV show that then that becomes like a false idol God, like Wathan, right? So we ask a lot as well to protect us from that. Well, you know, I, I, it's, I, there's so much I wanted to pick up on, but your last point about the sort of the, fi, the, the false idol or um, what becomes kind of the new um, um, standard by which we, like almost like a, a principle of the faith is, and, and you talk about this issue of funding, you know, like a lot of times what happens is because we also live in this age, this sort of call out culture that is, that is, that is permeated online media, especially um, is that organizations that get maligned, um, you know, because they were associated with, you know, money from um, for example, CVE money, for example. Right. And, and so, you know, saying no to CVE funding becomes kind of the, maybe clarify uh, what CVE uh, is. Right? Yeah. Count, countering violent extremism. Right. Um, right. And that, that becomes the kind of standard by which we uh, say, well, you know, these people are like this organization or this work is okay, or this organization is not okay because they, have either uh, uh, either uh, been accused of or have in fact received CVE funding. You see what I'm saying? Like it becomes right. kind of there's, the there's gatekeepers. The, well, yeah, the idea of gatekeepers or, or or sort of like who who assigns you know um, uh, orthodoxy to certain organ you know like and, and gives credence to the work that organizations. Yeah, yeah are doing. political orthodoxy. Right, I understand what you're right, saying. Right. So, and, and there's almost type of like political tech fear that goes on in our community there you go, too. Political tech fear. Thank and you. So, like for instance, yeah. I personally am not in favor of CVE, but CVE is something about whether one gets money or not. That's speculative. Like that's not something that is like firmly in religion. That say if you uh, cooperate with CVE in any shape or form, that that's haram and that's sinful. Right? There's th- th- we can we can disagree right. upon that now, but it, but but. but the same people who will be so harsh against organizations or certain scholars who may be doing soft CVE or getting CVE money mm-hmm. or took a certain trip somewhere uh, to uh, a country in the Middle East, for instance. We'll just, we'll just throw that out there, right? <laughs> Thank you. No, no, they, they'll that's... be really harsh about that. At yeah. the same time, in the name of intersectionality, some of these same organizational <laughs> activists will be on CVE and then will openly advance something that Allah and his messenger cursed, right? So like, it, like which is not – simply social political but it's something that is in the realm mm-hmm. uh, 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 of, uh, uh, of, of what's called the, right what is like incontrovertible truth in islam that again muslims have always agreed upon as part of and nahi al munkar for 1400 years from the sahaba from ahlu bayt from the awliyaullah right so that is part of the uh uh 
the bizarre nature of some of the things I see. And um, I have a lot of conversations with people about this, but yeah. I pick up the phone and call people. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's another lost art today. <laughs> I don't go to Facebook and blast <laughs> sister such and such or brother you know, such and people. such. Uh, yeah, I pick up the phone and, or text them, can I talk with you? Right. Uh, you know, because that's the way you're supposed to give nasiha. Um, you know, if, if we call someone out firstly and we do it in, in public, we shame them. Hmm. While if we give people advice in private, then this is actually a way of showing them honor to show them dignity. This is actually a saying of Imam Musa al-Qadim, one of the great uh, Imams from Ahlul Bayt, right? We're supposed to, this is the way we're supposed to do nasiha, That's right. right? But, but uh, now we have to call people out online and start a campaign <laughs> against them yeah. and boycott this scholar or boycott this activist. And that's not really the way forward. I, I think, I think that goes though to something that's just a broader problem societally, which is this sort of everything has become performative. Yeah. Everyone has become the star of their own reality show. Mm-hmm. And so this notion of, well, if I call somebody on the telephone, no one's watching. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem. But right. you can live stream the telephone conversation. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give people ideas. Right? There, there, there's yeah. two thoughts that um, I want to reflect on, uh, one from Imam and, and, and one from Mark. Um, first of all, Mark, I want to congratulate you on something, and I hope the audience hears this loud and clear. Um, this is, what did you call it? A bee in my bonnet? Yep. Is that the, I've never heard that before. So this is <laughs> one of the bees in my scarf. <laughs> the idea that you were careful enough, that you had enough humility to step into the great city of Detroit, and I consider myself a daughter of Detroit, and not replicate and duplicate. Now, the strategic planner in the room knows this makes me insane. The idea that you found the void and you picked that up, this is the true Islamic nature. Because if you were to replicate and duplicate without assessing and seeing the void, then that means it was all about you Mm -hmm. and not about the people. Mm -hmm. And this is really in what Imam Dawood's talking about. It's about that principle-centered leadership Mm -hmm. and about how we mentor that. And you're talking about the youth, but not only do we need to really mentor youth on Islamic, the the Islamic um, parameters, Mm -hmm which actually aren't as restrictive as we may be teaching them to be, but we need to really teach principle-centered leadership, which is the highest form of Islam. And so uh, I I say that because these are two people who are working um, as activists, and regarding the grassroots thing, I want to tell you is firsthand that building a grassroots organization requires a lot of pain, mm-hmm. a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of tears, mm-hmm. a lot of uncertainty, a lot of hope. It's much easier to take the other route and to um, almost sell yourself yeah. to the money. Mm-hmm. But I've learned, even though I've never done that, that that is very short-lived. Mm-hmm. Because if it's not principle based, if it's not principle centered, if it's not, um, if we haven't done the assessment as Muslim organizations to see where is the need, try to fill that void, longevity comes from the way we think about things and then the way we approach them. But in the end, as leaders of any organization, it's going to come back to the person. That's the bottom line. And if we are aligning with God and our daily du'a is to make us his servant and to hire us in our service and lower us in our nafs, that's the way the day at Fajr has to start. Because if you don't get out the gate Mm -hmm. with that kind of contemplation, that kind of alignment of your nafs, your heart, your intellect, you are going to make mistakes. So how you get out the gate every day is critically important. And then trying to maintain that, lowering that nafs. And it's tempting. Who's not tempted to be on NPR or at Harvard or whatever? I I actually have said no to a lot of things because the alignment would build me, but it would hurt Zaman. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so in the end, what am I taking with me? And I always think about that. Are those good deeds najahi? If they are, that's a big problem. If they belong to the other people, that's where we need to be. It's a very, it's a difficult battle. It's that like struggle and our nafs day in and day out. And so it's about training one's thinking. Mm-hmm. And that's why we're human, right? That, that's what separates us from the, from the animal kingdom is that frontal lobe. So when you're down on the ground, I just want to say, and that frontal lobe is being humbled on that ground, take that extra minute or two or three for not just the submission of the prayer, but for the submission of the self. Mm. And so that it's not just ritualistic, it's actually building your character. Mm. At a funeral um, for my uncle, somebody said, it's not the person and the body in the casket that matters. It's the character of the person and the casket that matters. Correct. It's true. Yeah, absolutely. Um, wow. I mean, it's just a, a lot to, uh, uh, I, I think we've covered a lot. And surprisingly, it's, you know, we've only gone about an hour into the show, which, you know, we can probably start, uh, you know, trying to bring the conversation to a close. I mean, I think we've opened up a lot of uh or, or we've touched on a lot of parts of the conversation that I did want to touch on um, with regards to activism and where we are as a community, because I think, you know, like we, 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 we talked about the dangers of sort of, you know, the online call out culture and, 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 and just kind of building and, and building up your own hype within, you know, social media or on- online platforms. And I think some of the dangers of that, I almost like sort of missed the days where people just did the work for doing the work, you know, for the, for the sake of the work and not have to worry about branding and, 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 and how they look online. But I get the realities of that at the same time. Um, but but maybe you know to sort of bring the the um, conversation to some sort of a conclusion um, from a practical point of view. Um, I think in addition to some of the sort of theoretical issues that we've talked about with regards to activism, um, you know, I, 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 I talked about this issue of mentorship and 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 not and and not recreating the wheel and not sort of knowing our lanes in terms of our, our the various organizations that we have. I think one of the problems that 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 also that 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 we as a community also face is that we're dealing with limited resources uh, to support the work that. That, that organizations are doing and 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 what you're doing by creating more and more organizations is just diluting those like that funding and diluting the sources and so how do we sort of move away from that and this was kind of what i you know sort of uh, it wasn't what you framed as the, or, or what you characterize uh, mark as the softball question but the idea of aligning ourselves with with other organizations that are doing work if not exactly similar to what we're doing or what the organization that I happen to be involved with or you happen to be involved with, whatever is the sake or case, but but to aligning ourselves with, with generally uh, generally aligning ourselves with other, other organizations that are doing common, you know, projects that are related. So I, I guess from a practical standpoint, you know, how do we maybe create some sort of a conversation on a national level among the Muslim community where, you know, we can share the work that we're doing so that other organizations that are either fledgling or starting off or have been in the game long enough but aren't, you know, well known outside of, say, provincial Detroit, to, 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 to use your expression, um, you, know, you know, how do we start those conversations and, and maybe creating some sort of a repository where people can find out more about organizations and things like that? So it's real sort of practical, uh, practical guidelines for activists and activism in general. Um, I don't have a great answer to that. I'm so, uh, maybe I'll, I'll start. And then if, if something else comes to mind as the Please. other speakers, I can yeah. try to jump back in. But, um, uh, you know, I'll say with, with our work, I, you know, with dream, I don't, um, you know, there's, we have to strike a balance, right? You know, a couple of years ago we had, uh, it's funny how time passes. So two summers ago, we had an article come out in the Nation magazine about Dream. Yeah, that was um, a really good piece. Uh, I was surprised. You, you never know what like a journalist is going to print about you at the end of the day when you agree to do stuff like that. But uh, but the framing was was right, and it was it was well written, and and um, and the learning for us was actually that we probably should have tried. To, we should have taken more advantage of it. Uh, you know, we didn't we didn't really promote it. Uh, you know, super intentionally, you know, it, it got, it got around, but we could have done a lot more with it. Um, 
the issue is that we we have to find a balance between. I mean, if 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 people if Muslims all across this country knew about Dream and we had still only completed one house, what's it worth? Right, like if if mm-hmm. the local community isn't actually bought into it, isn't right. aligned, isn't supporting, isn't moving in, isn't isn't doing the organizing work with us, isn't coming to our entrepreneurship classes, isn't coming out to our street fair over the summer, you know, isn't showing up at our neighborhood cleanups and board ups and tree plant, et cetera. If if none of that's happening, like what what's the publicity work? What's the like, right? You know that. that uh, so so part of it is it's just is striking that right balance and. When you do have those opportunities, making sure that they're really aligned with the work and that they really ultimately come back to benefit the core of the work as opposed to just being good publicity. Um, That's a good point. In, as far as the organizations go, I mean, I would love to see a proliferation of organizations in our community in every city. You know, when, so when we talk about the CVE conversation, right, and I know that uh, that Tatleaf came under some pressure for some funds that they were going to accept or whatnot, uh, you know, and I fall on the side of uh, – you know, not legitimizing the the surveillance state through accepting CVE funds. Period. Like I, that, that's that's my political analysis. Mm-hmm. But uh, but I would tell anybody go go do go do the work that Talif has done. Go replicate with with the with go go make a difference in as many lives of folks coming back to this religion or learning about it as Talif. Go do that in your city mm-hmm. before you try to tear them down. Mm. Right. Like that's that's what I mean. We we're so you know, and part of that is just. Uh, you know, it's it's people. The call out culture comes from people feeling a lack of of power, feeling a lack of access. Uh, but really, I think folks need to redirect their energies to to building, mm. um, and that's mm. that's what it comes down to a lot of times. Uh, and don't wait for. Ta- I mean, I was there when Talif started in Chicago. I'm my wife helped to facilitate some of that. It was great, and I've 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 been happy to see it flourish. Don't wait for Talif to come to your city. Find the local scholar who you can work with or scholars to help build a similar institution that's going to serve in the same sort of way, yeah. um, you know, before you start lobbing bombs or or instead of lobbing bombs at all. <laughs> so um, so that that's just what I would say along those lines. I, you know, and I think, you know, uh, we're at a point now with Dream where we're trying to, to get to a place where we can staff up finally. We've been entirely volunteer led for this whole time. Mm-hmm. And we're grateful for all the volunteers who helped us kind of get as far as we have. Um but we're certainly seeing the necessity to to like to professionalize the operation a little bit. Um, I hope that as we take that step, um, we continue to grow the volunteer base actually, uh, and that it doesn't become the, the the professional staff doesn't become a substitute for the people who are just putting in hours and hours of time out of their sheer commitment and love for the work and alignment with the vision. Um, you know, I think uh, you know. Things have changed as, as you know, over the last 40 years as the economy has changed. And now, you know, for the, you know, we have two parents, both parents working more often than you did in the 60s and so forth. But I think a, gen- a generation and a half ago, if you will, if not two, you saw uh, social organizations were much more um, enabled by the by the sheer will of volunteers and of people just coming together, willing to donate their time and energy to build them. Right. Um, and I think... If that if an organization is built like that, if it's built around people, if it's built around a membership, um, then it can be sustained, and that we won't we won't actually fall prey to like a you know diminishing resources. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. We you know Mark I I, I I I mean there's so much to appreciate of, of what you've said and what you've shared on the show. I mean, but if I could, you know, just I I, I tend to almost to a fault, speak in sort of abstracts and theoreticals. And so for you to just kind of name names and just kind of keeping it real, I, I, I want to thank you for that. Sure. Um, and so like, yeah, I mean, I was certainly, you know, referring, if not uh, uh, in particular, at least in general, to organizations like Dali for others that have been sort of, cu- that, that get caught up in this sort of online, you know. Uh, and I'm sure there are organizations that have brought a lot less value to our community that have accepted those funds, and I would be a lot less generous to them. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 uh, but Tatleaf in particular, Particular that struck yeah. a personal chord with me to Thank see them. You. Sort no, no, of come and under it, it, right, right, and and without and may even Allah grant Shafa to see Osama and, and, and we and we love him, and if Sidi Osama is listening, we love you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, it, and it's like Zucky made this point yesterday. Um, you know, we've been doing the show for six years now, almost, and we're at about eighty episodes in. But that first episode was with Osama Cannon, right? Yeah. And so, kind of a very special way to sort of launch the uh, podcast, as it were. But uh, thank you for that, um, Imam Dawood, and you know, thank you, 
all, all three of you. It's just been a great conversation. Um, you know, I, I think um, uh, I, I should have said this at the outset, but I, but I, I, and I, and I say that very in, in, in the most sincerest sense that. I think we could have had any one of you on the show and made it a very, uh, you know, insightful and deep conversation around not only your particular backgrounds, but the work you're doing. So I, I almost I, I appreciate the fact that you agreed to be a part of a panel, um, but I hope that we can have you back on the show individually to kind of flesh out and talk more in detail um, or, or to unpack as it were, um, you know, with, you know, to, with regards to the work that you're doing, but, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, yeah, we, we, we hope that the, um, you know, that, that, that our listeners enjoy the conversation. Um, you know, as always, um, you can reach us, you can reach out to us with questions, with comment, with, with comments, with feedback. Um, maybe Zucky, you can close this out and tell us where people can find us and find out more about the podcast. Yeah. Well, uh, you can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can also hit like on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. Uh, please go to iTunes and leave a review, leave a star rating. Every little bit helps. We also have a Patreon page where you can support us uh, uh, through monthly donations. Pervis, what's the... Uh, patreon.com slash diffuse congruence yeah you can become a, a monthly patron of the show we've got some patrons in the audience actually so thank you so much for those who've who have gone to the, our patreon page and, and become patrons of the show um every little bit helps and not only in terms of feedback but also um in, in terms of becoming a monthly patron so thank you for those who've done that and i always say even if it's a little as a dollar a month i mean that goes a long way uh if 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 you know so whatever you can do and uh, once again, I want to thank our panel. I'd like our audience to please give our panel a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to and and thank you to Z- uh, Zaman International for really again hosting us. Thank you, Najah. This was beautiful, and uh, I wish people could see what I'm looking at when you look at when you overlook the warehouse and the the, uh, the the like the work that you're doing here. I think it's so critical. So people can certainly find out more at Zaman International dot 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 org or is it dot com. Dot org, um, and same with uh, Dream of Detroit. It's, it's Dream of Detroit dot Dream of Detroit dot org. Yeah. Dot org. And Imam Dawood, if people wanted to reach out to you, find out more about the work that you're doing, where can people do? You know, where can people find that? Find you, seek you out, as it were. Um, they can uh, just hit me up on Facebook. <laughs> there you go. That's fine. Okay, great. So, thank you again, everyone, and uh, we look forward to having you on the uh, having you on future episodes. And uh, please do continue to listen to the podcast. Thank and you. and thank you, uh, Michigan, yeah. for hosting Diffuse Congrats. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>